What's up, guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to a new series, What If Zoro Was Reborn in JJK as Toji's Son? Part 1. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Consider joining my Patreon to support the channel. With all that about the way, let's get into it. There was nothing but murky darkness. Then suddenly, a path appeared. It was straight and stark white. Twinkle. Zaro opened his eyes. Blink, blink. His two gray pupils appeared and disappeared with the movement of his eyelids. The bright lights, a swaying mobile, and a ceiling with bland patterns, came into his still blurry vision. The room was filled with warmth, making it cozy. Was it a dream? What dream was it? Zaro briefly wondered before giving up. If it was important, he'd remember it later. I'm thirsty. He tried to get up, but his body wouldn't move. Zaro frowned as he only managed to roll his legs while lying down. Seeing his hands, now too small to even hold a sword handle, he finally realized the situation. Ah, that's right. Rurano as Zoro had become a baby. To be precise, he was reborn as a baby. How, you might ask? Zaro himself didn't know. In his last memory, he had lost consciousness from bleeding too much. When he came to, he was in a baby's body inside his mother's womb. Not long after, he was born into the world. For Zaro, who had roamed the Grand Line encountering all sorts of incidents, this was absurd. However, he had a vague idea of what might have happened. Reincarnation. It meant that Trurano as Zoro had died from his injuries and was reborn in the body of a baby. Sigh. He sighed inwardly. It wasn't that he had never seen someone come back to life. But he had never imagined he would be that person. Why had this happened? Zaro pondered for a moment. It's not the power of a devil fruit. Brook, who had consumed the Yomi Yomi no Mi, was still alive, so it couldn't be another user of the same fruit. Even if there were other devil fruits that interfered with life and death, none of the beings Zoro encountered that day possessed such powers. So, it must be the whims of the Grand Line, after all. The world's greatest, most dangerous, and most mysterious sea, the Grand Line. Nothing that happens there is ever surprising. Especially not in the latter half, the New World, as opposed to the relatively peaceful first half, Paradise. I should have been more careful. It was a meaningless thought after the fact. Zaro reaffirmed the vow he had made time and again to become stronger. After all, it was merely speculation, the truth remained unknown. I'll have to figure it out when I grow up. Even if Zoro had been a swordsman with no equal in his past life, he was now just a newborn baby. It was difficult to do anything in such a state. Growing up was the immediate priority. Thump, thump. Someone was walking towards him. Then suddenly, a face appeared in Zoro's field of vision. Zaro stopped thinking and stared intently at the face. His vision was still blurry, but he could make out that it was a woman with messy black hair. Are you awake, Zoro? A gentle voice spoke, and the face changed subtly. The woman was smiling at Zoro. Even without using observation hockey, he could tell. Let's eat. The woman's name was Jie. She was Zoro's birth mother in this life. Mother. Zoro rolled that unfamiliar word around in his mouth. Mother, mother. In his previous life, he had no mother. Of course, being human, he wasn't born alone, so she did exist, but there was nothing about her left in his memory. The same was true for his father. He had no recollection of what kind of person he was, what he said, or what his last moments were like. Zaro didn't even remember their names and had to ask the villagers. His mother was named Tara, and his father was Rurano Arashi. Tara had died of illness when Zaro was one year old, and not long after, Rurano Arashi was killed in a battle with pirates who raided their village. He felt no particular emotion about this. There was nothing to miss, be sad about, or hurt by since he didn't remember anything, so he was just indifferent. He did clean their graves and leave flowers occasionally, but, well. It wasn't that Zoro held any deep feelings or emotions for them. It was merely the minimum duty as their child. Chia hummed a little tune as she prepared formula in a bottle. Therefore, Zoro, now well into his twenties, didn't quite know how to interact with his newfound biological mother. It wasn't that he disliked her, but, somehow, it felt awkward. It's ready. Our Zoro must be hungry. Let's eat quickly. Aha. Uh -huh. He wanted to respond, but being a baby, only an unintelligible babble came out. Zaro's face turned red. Jess smiled broadly. Did you answer mommy? Our Zaro is so good. She picked Zoro up and put the bottle of formula to his mouth. It was a bit, actually, quite embarrassing, but it would have been a thousand times more embarrassing if Jia had tried to breastfeed him, so Zoro quietly sucked on the formula. Watching him intently, Jia spoke up. Our Zoro is so pretty. He almost choked. 
Zoro glared at Chia after managing to gulp down the formula, but his blurry vision could still clearly see the affection, causing him to cool down immediately. Yeah, to her, he's the child she bore, unaware that the spirit in sight is that of a man in his twenties, a former pirate Zoro resigned himself to the situation. The first day was even worse than this. Suddenly remembering that day, he thought about the day he was born. On the day of Zoro's birth, Jack cried a lot. Despite not knowing where he was or what had happened, the thought crossed his mind that crying so much must be exhausting. The nurse repeatedly said the baby needed to be taken away, but Jack continued to hold Zoro in her arms and cry. I'm so relieved, my baby. So very relieved. Thank you for coming safely to mommy's side. She kept repeating those words. It's not as desperate now. Yet, the affection she showed Zoro remained unchanged. A large figure appeared behind Chie. From its size and general shape, it was clearly a big man. Familiar with the figure, Zoro focused on finishing his formula. The man approached Chie's side and asked, doesn't your wrist hurt? It's just for a while as I feed him the formula. It's fine. Do you want to hold him, Toji? The man, called Toji, was silent for a moment before he flatly replied, No. Why? Try holding him. Zaro turned his gaze to look up at the man's face. Like Chie, the details of the man's face were unclear to Zoro's imperfect vision. The only discernible features were his jet black hair and large build. It was a bit of a dilemma. Zaro needed to know more about this man, Toji. After all, he was his father in this life. Although the details of his expression were not visible, it was clear from Chie's words that Toji had stiffened significantly. Zoro's observation hockey hadn't developed in a way to sense people's emotions like Luffy or the cook Sanji, but such an overt reaction was noticeable even without such skills. The reason was obvious, as Toji typically reacted this way when looked at. His body stiffened while being stared at. Is it dislike, or is he wary? Or perhaps there was another reason. So far, Toji had never attempted to harm Zoro or Chie, so there was no particular resentment. However, Zoro was somewhat curious about the reason. Zoro looked at Toji quietly and then reached out his hand towards him, wanting to see him closer. Of course, his body, only days old, didn't move as he wished, and his hand flailed in the air for a moment. Look at that. Zoro is looking for his dad too. Hold him for a bit, Toji. Toji hesitated. What's wrong, Toji? He's too small. Fragile. Jie laughed softly. Are you worried that Zoro will shrink if you hold him? As long as you don't squeeze too hard, he won't get hurt. Just try holding him. As if passing a baton, Jie handed Zoro over to Toji. Big, rigid hands held Zoro. It was an awkward stance that clearly showed a lack of experience. It seemed like he needed to relax his grip, but he was too afraid of letting go, resulting in a half-hearted hold. Thick arms came closer. A hand that had been hesitantly hovering over Zoro's head briefly touched his cheek, then retracted as if burned. He doesn't dislike me. Zoro thought. Naturally, a question followed. If he doesn't dislike me, why did he act that way? Zoro looked up at Toji with a frown. Times like these made him particularly frustrated with a newborn's blurry vision. If only he could see the face clearly, he might understand something. The wandering palm eventually found its way, slowly stroking down Zoro's back. Burp. A burp slipped out from Zoro's mouth without him realizing it, causing his face to heat up. Of course, Chia had said it was good for babies to burp after feeding. But still. Toji stiffened for a moment, then let out a small laugh. It wasn't a sneer, but a laugh filled with warmth and a touch of pride. That laugh was very similar to Chia's. He gently tapped Zoro's back with his hand in a slow rhythm, similar to what Chia had done. It was as if saying it was okay to continue. Zoro hunched his body, his face flushed red. He was embarrassed. Very much so. Today was a very important day for Zoro. He whipped his head around, surveying his surroundings. Now 10 months old, he could move his head freely as he wished. His vision had also improved significantly. No one was around, and the atmosphere was quiet. He wasn't in bed but on the floor, well fed and in good condition. It was a rare perfect opportunity. Carefully, he pulled his sitting body up, pressing his feet against the floor and pushing. Despite the lack of strength in his arms, torso, and legs, which made a straining noise, he didn't care. Wobbling, with his feet sliding and legs trembling, Zaro slowly but determinedly stood up. Lifting his head, he saw a higher perspective. Standing at 10 months old wasn't very tall, but it was still a significant change. Finally. He had stood up for the first time in 10 long months without holding onto furniture or poles, all by himself. Despite numerous attempts, this was the first time he had succeeded. Most attempts were stopped by Chia or Toji, deeming it too dangerous. This triumph came in a rare moment when both Chia and Toji were absent. Maybe walking is possible too. He cautiously stepped forward with his right foot, then carefully with his left. One step. Then another. And then. 
His right foot twisted, and his body suddenly lurched forward. His arms flailed, unable to find the ground in time. He braced for a tumble, calmly watching the ground approach. Thump. Thick, solid arms appeared between Zoro and the ground, catching him. Looking up, he saw a panting Toji. It was odd for him to be out of breath just from a little run inside the house, Zoro thought. Zoro, are you okay? Toji stopped mid-sentence, hugging Zoro tightly and checking him over. His eyes, lost, scanned every part of Zoro's body until he was sure there were no injuries, then he relaxed slightly. Toji sighed and gently leaned his head against Zoro, a tremble even in that small contact. It was an odd behavior, like a large beast leaning on a much smaller herbivore. Don't do dangerous things when mom and dad aren't around. If you get hurt, both your mom and I will be sad. Zoro knew that. Over the past 10 months, he had continually witnessed how much Chia and Toji cherish him. Chia had been devoted to Zoro from the start, and even Toji, who initially found Zoro's presence awkward, gradually grew closer to him. Toji enjoyed playing with Zoro, but never allowed her engaged in any activity that could even slightly risk Zoro getting hurt. Like now. I couldn't have been seriously hurt even if I tried. The floor Zoro was walking on was covered with soft, child-friendly tiles, and all the furniture corners in the house were padded to prevent injury in case he bumped into them. It's an overreaction. He had no intention of getting hurt in the first place. If he did fall, he planned to cloak himself in armament hockey. Having become a baby, Zoro lost much of the physical strength he had built up in his previous life, but not as hockey. Hockey was a power of the spirit, not the body. I'm not there with conqueror's hockey yet. His observation and armament hockey were as proficient as in his previous life. And Zoro's mastery of armament hockey was not so feeble that a mere fall would injure him. However, that was something neither Toji nor Chia knew. Zoro looked intently at Toji, who was breathing heavily as if he had just been pulled from drowning. Then, he slowly spoke up. So, Rai. Toji exhaled sharply and stroked Zoro's green hair. There's no need to rush. Whether it's walking or running, you'll be able to do it all in time. You're especially quick, too Toji's voice trailed off. In fact, Zoro's physical development was remarkably rapid, to the point where a concerned Chia and Toji had taken him to the hospital a few times. Of course, no issues were found. The reason Zoro kept trying to use his body was that he was dissatisfied. It's frustrating. Not being able to walk on his own? After 10 whole months since his birth. Of course, for most babies, this was normal, but for Zoro, it was not. Being reborn and unable to wield a sword was hard enough, but pretending to be a typical baby by just lying around was beyond Zoro's limited patience. Toji tapped Zoro's head with his finger. You can't now, with your head looking like a mossy rock. Maybe when it's more like a mossy boulder, you can try walking on your own. Who's a rock? That would be you, my boy. Suddenly, there was a sound, and Zoro looked down. Plastic fragments had fallen from Toji's hand, clearly pieces of something that had been whole. Glancing at Toji, Toji awkwardly shifted his gaze and covered the fragments with his foot. It's nothing. It was obviously something. Whatever he had broken was unclear. Zoro had known Toji was strong and powerful, but he had never seen him break anything in their daily life. He usually controls his strength so well. He must have been too rushed coming here, completely unnecessary. There was a sound of the door moving. Toji quickly shoved the pieces under the sofa and swiftly looked at Zoro. Zoro easily understood the meaning. Keep silent. Zoro nodded. The door closed, and Chia walked into the house. Zoro. Toji. At the sound of Chia's bright voice, both men looked up simultaneously. Toji picked up Zoro and approached Chia. Guess what I brought? Ta-da. From the black plastic bag Chia was holding, she took out a box of food that emitted a delicious aroma. Opening the box, steam rose, releasing a greasy smell. Toji's favorite, grilled intestines. A brief smile appeared on Toji's face. Zaro knew that the smile wasn't for the intestines, but appeared after seeing Jie. Sounds good, let's eat together. Okay. Just a sec, I'll get something ready for Zoro. It must be delicious. Zaro licked his lips at the sight of the intestines, but he was too young to eat it. He didn't have enough teeth yet. Zaro is still little, how about something else? Chia looked down at Zoro and smiled warmly. The memory of the first time Zoro had called out Jie and her face lit up like a sunflower overlapped with this moment. Unlike Toji, who became more playful and comfortable with Zoro over time, Chia hadn't changed much from when Zoro was born to now. She always smiled brightly, was endlessly kind, and looked at him with eyes sparkling with affection. Unconditional and consistent love is rare. For someone like Zoro, even more so. Zoro watched her face for a moment and then nodded. Suddenly, Toji spoke up as if he had just remembered something. Oh, Chia. This guy walked today. Really how did it happen? Despite agreeing to keep silent. Zoro glared at Toji ferociously. 
Toji looked back at Zoro and grinned, his lips moving. It was you who said to keep silent. It was absurd. So, he hadn't promised not to tell? Zoro considered punching him in the chest, but then thought better of it. With his current soft body, Zoro was more likely to get hurt himself. He wouldn't go as far as to use armament hockey for this. It's my fault for trusting him. Zoro let out a small groan. How did it happen? Did you fall? Wait, don't tell me you walked on the bed? No, on the floor. The floor? But you were on the bed when I left. Toji. You were supposed to keep an eye on him when he's on the floor. Chess smacked Toji's back repeatedly. It was somewhat satisfying to watch, but the satisfaction vanished when Toji pretended to be hurt even though he clearly wasn't. Che should know he's faking. Regardless of how many hits Toji took, he stayed glued to Che's side, holding Zoro tightly in his arms. Zoro smiled faintly, listening to the back and forth between his parents. It was another typical, pleasant afternoon. Zoro was in a crowded place for the first time in a long while. It was a tall and large building called a supermarket, a place that sold a variety of items. It was like having a market inside a building. Everywhere you looked, there were people bustling about, each carrying baskets or pushing carts made of metal, filled with goods. It was a sight he had never seen in his previous life. It makes sense, given the different world. Not long ago, Zaro had realized that the place he was born into was not somewhere in the world of his previous life, but an entirely different world altogether. I did think it was strange. There were too many things he had never seen before, and none of the things he knew existed here. Things like devil fruits, hockey, pirates, or the endless expanses of sea. For a place supposedly in one of the four blues, unreachable by the sea's information, there were too many advanced technological items, such as machines called TVs, that functioned like den den mushy for visual communication, or elevators, pulleys that moved on their own with the press of a button. And then, there were things he had never felt in his previous life. It was too odd to be one of the four blues, so he had wondered if it might be an island in the new world, inaccessible to outsiders to think it was an entirely different world. Truly, it was astonishing. With a flash. Toji lifted Zoro into a small space in the metal cart designed for small children like Zoro to sit in, fitting him perfectly. After making sure Zoro was comfortably seated, Toji instructed him. Don't ever try to get out of the cart. Zoro made a sullen face but eventually nodded. At 16 months old, he could walk, but he didn't have the stamina to wander around the vast interior of the building continuously. Glancing around. Passersby sneaked peeks at Zoro. Their gazes were filled with curiosity. Zoro touched the top of his head. Between his fingers, thin strands of grass-like green hair peeked out. Even in this life, his hair was green. It was puzzling why, even though his parents had changed, this hadn't. Zoro turned his body, sensing the ominous aura. Toji, who was pushing the cart from behind, gripped the cart as if he was about to crush it, glaring at the people sneaking glances at Zoro. Che, busy selecting fruits on the other side, was unaware of Toji's state, but Zoro noticed. Toji. At Zoro's soft call, the menacing aura surrounding Toji dissipated. Toji forced a smile at Zoro, but it was colder than usual. It's okay. It didn't matter what others whispered. If he had cared about such things, he wouldn't have become a great pirate with wanted posters spread across the seas. Even when he wasn't a pirate, Zoro had seen countless people tremble in fear of him. The sneaky glances meant nothing. I'm fine. Toji looked at Zoro for a moment, then ruffled Zoro's hair with his thick hand. As soon as Jia approached, he moved the cart to a less crowded area. Since the shopping was mainly done by Chia and Toji, Zoro essentially just sat there. He tried sneakily to add a bottle of alcohol to the cart, but Toji, almost like a ghost, noticed and removed it, thwarting the attempt. Should we make chili shrimp or fried shrimp? Chia's voice floated from afar, asking Toji. Zoro half listened, half ignored, when suddenly mommy, it hurts. Zoro turned his head towards the sound. A few steps away from the cart, a girl slightly older than Zoro, clung to her mother's skirt, whining. Mommy, my head. My head. What's wrong with your head? Does it hurt? Someone, someone chewed it up. My head, my head. Does your head hurt? You took medicine earlier, is it still hurting? It hurts. It keeps hurting. I hate it, uh, I hate it soon, the girl burst into tears. Her mother, unsure of what to do, held her and tried to comfort her, but the girl's crying did not stop. Zaro's gaze naturally drifted to the girl's head. Her hair, tied in pigtails with pink bands, showed nothing unusual. But just because it's not visible, doesn't mean it's not there. Zaro's proficiency in observation hockey was the weakest among the three types of hockey, and it hadn't developed in a way that allowed him to sense others' emotions. However, he was not so feeble as to miss detecting pure malice of that magnitude. Especially if it was coiling its long body around the child, opening its massive maw to chew on the child's head with blunt teeth. Eek, eek. A sound was heard. Or could it be called a sound? 
It wasn't something heard with the ears, but rather a presence felt, something revolting, armed with pure malice. The child's mother was still busy comforting her crying child, not removing the something gnawing at the child's head, which felt bizarrely odd. It's not that they are pretending not to see, they truly cannot see it. Neither the child nor the child's mother. The something on the child's head turned towards him. Nothing was visible to the eye, but Zoro could tell their gazes had met. The something slithered towards Zoro like a snake, filled with a murderous intent as if it would kill him on the spot. But it was slow. Exasperatingly slow. Facing an enemy after so long, Zoro's gray eyes deepened. The adversary had chosen poorly, but Zoro was not merciful enough to let it go. He reached out his hand. The oblivious something opened its mouth wide towards Zoro's hand. Just before Zoro's hand touched the something, schlick. The something was silently sliced in half, dying instantly. The presence detected by his observation hockey disappeared, leaving only the bisected corpse. TSK, Zoro clicked his tongue. Boring. It ended too anticlimactically. Of course, it was nothing more than trash, not even worth the level of a navy colonel, but to die without putting up any fight was unexpected. Mommy, it doesn't hurt anymore. It doesn't? Maybe the medicine is finally working. That's a relief. Seeing the relieved mother hug her child, a faint smile appeared on Zoro's lips. Well, that turned out well. Ah, Toji had arrived. Realizing this, Zoro turned around. Their eyes met. Toji seemed very surprised. He was so startled that he stood frozen in place, holding a dagger. His face was pale, and his green eyes trembled as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Why? Zoro tilted his head in confusion. Even though Toji's presence was somewhat faint, anyone with a degree of training in observation hockey should not fail to notice someone as strong as Toji approaching from behind. It wasn't a movement so fast that it couldn't be noticed, he had walked over slowly. Especially with a weapon in hand. The sight of the dagger made Zoro's eyes sparkle. Being born in a country with stable public order in this life, and with Xie and Toji absolutely not allowing any weapons near Zoro, seeing a proper weapon was almost a first for him in this life. Noticing Zoro's gleaming eyes, Toji quickly stashed the dagger away. Zoro, you Toji started to say something, but then bit his lip, seemingly debating whether to ask. What could there be that he couldn't ask Zoro? Did you see it? See what? Ah, uh, was he talking about the something that was just killed? To be precise, he hadn't seen it. He had felt its presence through observation hockey, but with his naked eyes, he saw nothing. Toji examined Zoro's face as if searching for something. His expression, marked by scars, twisted. It was unclear whether he was happy, disappointed, or relieved. Toji exhaled deeply and then roughly ruffled Zoro's hair with his large hand. If you didn't see it, that's good. That settles it. Toji held his head, a flurry of emotions crossing his face. It can't be. Must be a mistake. Unable to see it Toji murmured more to himself than to Zoro. Zoro wanted to ask what he meant, but just then, Chia appeared with a bottle of sauce in hand. Toji, should we buy this too? Last time, it seemed like Zoro liked it. Sure. The moment Xia faced him, Toji's face returned to normal. Zoro stared at Toji for a while, then slowly shifted his gaze to Xia. Just as things that were commonplace in his previous life did not exist here, there were things in this life that had not existed in his previous one. For instance, the dark energy tangled inside Xia's stomach. This energy usually resided quietly inside a person's body, but when they became angry or sad, it would seep out a little. Zoro didn't know what became of this energy once it escaped. But now, I might have some idea. Zoro thought back to the something from earlier. Not a creature housing the energy in a physical form, but one made entirely of that sinister energy. In his previous life, Zoro had neither seen, heard of, nor felt such things. The world was vast, and all sorts of things happened, so perhaps it existed somewhere in his previous world, but it certainly wasn't a widely known power, at least not to Zoro's knowledge. Everyone in this world possessed that energy. Che, passersby, everyone Zoro met in the supermarket, and even Zoro himself except for Toji. Zoro stopped his train of thought there. It was pointless to think about it now. Knowledge only becomes useful when one has the situation and power to utilize it. Knowing about it now, when he hadn't even turned two, meant there was nothing Zoro could do. Next time. If he encountered such a thing again, he would have to observe more closely. That's what Zoro thought. However, after that day, Zoro never again encountered such a something. Che was pregnant. As spring arrived with the changing of the year, Chia began to sleep more and became picky with her food. These symptoms could be considered mild, but Toji couldn't stand even the slightest anomaly concerning Zoro or Chia. He immediately took her to the hospital, where they received the diagnosis of pregnancy. Zoro was there too. Now two years old, he was still too young to be left alone at home. When Zoro heard that Chia was pregnant, his mind went blank. It was understandable. 
His parents were always affectionate with each other, spending all their time together since neither of them worked. Still, the news felt strange. Before Zoro could even process this odd feeling, Chia began to cry. Having never seen Chia cry, Zoro was startled and immediately went to her side, looking into her eyes. When he called her mother, Chia looked up. Seeing her face, Zoro felt relieved. Her gray eyes weren't filled with sorrow, but sparkled with joy and emotion. Toji, taken aback at first, then hugged Chia tightly. He quickly let go, as if worried that hugging her too strongly might harm her. As long as Chia is smiling. That was enough. Even if they were tears of joy, Chia's smile was much more pleasant to see. After receiving some advice from the doctor and obtaining an ultrasound photo, they left the hospital. Toji treated Chia with extreme care, as if she were made of sugar. Back home, Zaro stared intently at the ultrasound photo, showing a white blotch within a black circle. This baby would be Toji and Chia's second child. And Zaro's sibling. A sibling naturally, Zaro's previous life had not included any blood-related siblings. He barely knew his parents' names, which he had learned from the villagers, let alone had any siblings. There were those who had offered to consider him a brother, though they were not related by blood. However, they were actually older than Zoro and adults. Even when considering younger members of his crew, it wasn't much help. Luffy was younger but was unmistakably the captain, and Yusuf felt more like a friend than a sibling. Nami was well, terrifying at times, even in Zoro's view. Chopper was probably the most naive member of the crew, but despite his innocence and lack of knowledge, he was competent in his duties. Very different from a newborn sibling. Zoro remembered his own time as a newborn. He was incredibly fragile and weak, able to do nothing. Even Zoro's sibling, not being a reincarnated individual, would have a mind of an infant, unlike Zoro, whose mind remained that of an adult. It would likely take years before the sibling could form coherent thoughts. Perhaps it wouldn't be until after at least five years post-birth? Zoro couldn't fathom how to interact with them. Was it just about providing protection unconditionally? Watching over them until they grew up? Or, like Chia and Toji did for Zoro, actively raising them by feeding, putting them to sleep, and playing with them. Zoro. Called by Chia, he stopped his musings and looked up. Chia was sitting on a plush sofa in the middle of the living room, though he hadn't noticed when she sat down. What are you thinking about? Approaching Chia, she opened her arms as if to hug him, but Zoro shook his head. About the sibling. Are you worried about mommy and the baby getting hurt? You're so mature, Zoro. He looked at her still flat belly. It was hard to believe his sibling was inside. Mother. Yes? What should I do? Chia's movements halted abruptly. Her eyes widened, then took on a slightly sad hue. In her eyes, Zoro had always been an unusually mature child. He developed faster than other children and, except for his newborn days, he rarely whined or pestered. Despite being mostly silent, he seemed to understand more about the world than other children his age who constantly asked questions, understanding most conversations. Sometimes, it seemed like he knew more than even Toji and Xie. Though he appeared stubborn and willful, he always prioritized his parents, leading them to worry he might be suppressing his desires. Instead of showing jealousy over the news of having a sibling, he asked what he could do for them. Chia pondered what to say to a child asking such a question. Her hand eventually rested on Zoro's coarse green hair. With a gentle touch, she tenderly stroked his head, treating him with utmost care. Zoro. My baby. Huh. You don't need to do anything for mom and dad. Because just by coming to our side, you've already made mom and dad very, very happy. When Chia was pregnant with Zoro, she was joyful yet fearful because Zoro showed no movement while in her womb. His heart was beating, and there were no dangerous signs according to hospital tests, but that was it. There was no fetal movement until just before birth. She tried eating sweet foods and lying down to concentrate on feeling any movement, but she never felt anything. Chia was anxious until the moment Zoro was born, worried that something might have gone wrong with him inside her womb. Therefore, Chia could never forget the moment of Zoro's birth. Despite the pain of labor, she couldn't take her eyes off his wrinkled red body, his short green hair wet from the amniotic fluid, the warmth when he was placed in her arms, and when their gray eyes met for the first time. She even remembered the tears in Toji's eyes when Zoro was first handed to him. It's a moment she'll likely never forget as long as this life lasts. Zoro was their child, the fruit of their love, embodying hope, wish, and future all at once. Seeing the deep, stirring look in Zoro's eyes, Chia smiled. He was such a good child. And for your sibling protecting, nurturing, and teaching were the parents' duties, not something to be handed over to a son not yet three years old. She didn't want to tell him not to fight or to get along well, she didn't have to. Chia knew Zoro would treat his sibling kindly without being asked. Tell them you love them. Since he was a child who felt embarrassed expressing affection verbally. Though he expressed plenty through his actions, sometimes it's necessary to express it in words. 
If he could do just that, Chia wouldn't ask for anything more from Zoro. Zoro was puzzled. Was that really all it took? Is that enough? Yes. That's enough. Can you promise mom that? Chia smiled gently. Zoro asked with a hesitant face. Just by saying that? You won't just say it. Mom believes in you. There was nothing more Zoro could say to that. Even if Zoro himself was a bit confused by it, how Chia could be so trusting was beyond him. Okay. Chia slowly pulled Zoro's head into a hug. As his face pressed against her stomach, Zoro held his breath, worried that any movement from him might startle Chia and the baby. I love you, Zoro. Even when your sibling is born, mom and dad will love you just the same. The time the three of us have together might decrease, but it doesn't mean we love you any less or not at all. Of course. He had never thought otherwise. It was natural to pay more attention to a much younger sibling. And the love Chia and Toji had for Zoro wasn't something that would be shaken by the presence of a sibling. Even Zoro knew that much. Chia then released Zoro. Since I named you, Zoro, we should let dad name your sibling. Mom named me? It was the first time he had heard this. Chia nodded gently in confirmation. Yes. Originally, I wanted dad to name you, but when you were born, I just felt like I wanted to name you. And dad couldn't decide on a name until the very last moment. Chia chuckled softly. Watching her laugh, Zoro asked, why Zoro? Zoro. Born on November 11th. Both in his previous life and this one, his name and birthday remain the same. It would be a lie to say he never found it odd. That's why he was curious. Why did Chia choose the name Zoro for him? Chia scratched her cheek, pondering. It just felt right. It seemed like you had to be named Zoro. The name that spontaneously came to Chia's mind and stayed there the moment she locked eyes with her baby. When she voiced it out loud, those gray eyes shining with the same hue as hers, seemed to confirm it was the name meant for him from the start. Zoro. Do you like it? Yes. It was always my name, after all. Zoro swallowed those words, keeping them to himself. Upon being told by Chia to choose a name, Toji pondered for a long time. It wasn't until after Chia's belly had grown alarmingly large, and Zoro's third birthday had passed that he finally spoke in front of Zoro and Chia. Megumi. It sounded familiar. Zoro furrowed his brow. What did it mean? After struggling to recall, Zoro simply asked Toji. What does it mean? Blessing. Ah. Right. That's what it meant. Zoro remembered what the name signified from his memories. Blessing, grace, love, kindness, wisdom, intelligence. That's nice. Zoro sincerely thought so. However, Chia tilted her head in confusion. But it's a boy? They had already visited the hospital to find out the baby's sex. Zoro's sibling was going to be a boy. Zoro asked curiously. Why does that matter? It's usually given to girls. The name Megumi, that is. I see. Still, Zoro liked the name Megumi. After a moment of silence, Toji said, still. Okay, got it. Megumi. Megumi. Chia, holding her cold belly, said happily. Zoro looked around. Despite the late autumn transitioning into winter, the air inside the house was warm and cozy. The house was filled with items for the new baby formula, a crib, mobiles, and toys, all shining and waiting for the baby's arrival. It seemed all that remained was sheer happiness. On the day Megumi was born, Zoro and Toji saw the baby together. The newly met sibling was incredibly, incredibly small. Entirely red and wrinkly, so tiny that it almost didn't seem human. Zoro felt he understood why Toji had been afraid to hold him when he was born. Too fragile. Extending a hand seemed like it could cause harm right then. Initially, Megumi was with the nurses in the baby room, and Zoro and Toji could only watch from beyond a glass wall, unable to reach out and touch. When the family of three became four and returned home, Chia laid Megumi in the crib and called Zoro over. Zoro, say hello. It's your sibling. Chia said, her eyes brimming with tears. Standing alongside Toji in front of the baby, Zoro offered his first greeting. Hello. Hello Megumi. I'm Zoro. Your brother. Take care. My sibling. Megumi whimpered. Zoro, startled, stepped back. Toji, taking over for the tired Chia, held Megumi, his soothing voice identical to the one from Zoro's memories. Do you want to hold him? Faced with Chia's question, Zoro was taken aback. Though he had grown stronger and more adept at handling various objects since turning three, he wasn't confident he could properly hold a baby. As he was about to shake his head, Toji turned towards Zoro. Kneeling to match Zoro's eye level, Toji offered Megumi to him. I'll support you, so try holding him. Huh, don't grip too tightly. Zoro awkwardly took Megumi into his arms. Toji kept one hand under Megumi, ready to catch him if Zoro faltered. Hearing a small whimper, Zoro instinctively adjusted Megumi to a more comfortable position. He couldn't ponder whether the baby felt soft or squishy. Zoro wasn't in a state to explore how his sibling felt to the touch. But he did feel warmth. 
As time passed, Megumi grew rapidly. Still small, but the redness and wrinkliness had greatly diminished. Unlike Zoro, who didn't particularly resemble either Chia or Toji apart from the color of his eyes, Megumi bore a striking resemblance to both of his parents. He's the spitting image of Toji. Chia would often say, though Toji didn't quite agree. Well, I think he looks like you. Zoro thought there was truth to both statements. Megumi's black hair and green eyes, along with his overall facial features, were very much like Toji's. However, his stubbornly sticking out hair and gentle nature were more like Chia's. Zaro increasingly found himself touching Megumi's rebellious hair. It prickled when touched, promising to be quite a sight as he grew. I wished he hadn't inherited that. No matter how much you comb it, it just sticks out. Jia complained. Remembering Chia struggling with her hair before outings made Zoro quietly laugh. Megumi probably doesn't mind being like mom. Where did you learn to talk like that? Chia laughed softly, leaning over the crib where Megumi lay. Despite having been considerably larger after giving birth, Chia's belly had gradually returned to its pre-pregnancy size. Waking from his nap, Megumi blinked his green eyes and then whimpered, seemingly hungry. Chia picked him up to feed him formula, gently patting his back. A soft smile appeared on her face as Megumi peacefully fell asleep. Toji stopped what he was doing to watch this scene, his expression one of disbelief. A faint smell of grass wafted in through the open window. The chilly air warmed, and buds sprouted on trees. The season had seamlessly transitioned into full spring. March was almost over, and April was just around the corner. Chia, as if struck by a sudden thought, suggested, when the cherry blossoms bloom, shall the four of us go to see them? Since Megumi was still very young, they wouldn't go far. Maybe just to the nearby park. Yeah. Toji responded in a voice that seemed choked, deeply resonant. Zaro could envision the scene of that day in his mind. Under the cherry trees laden with pink blossoms, a picnic blanket spread out. Sandwiches that Chia loves, alongside meat dishes favored by Toji and Zoro. Toji would, as always, be right by Chia's side, and Zoro would likely be between the two. Megumi would be cradled in someone's arms among the three. When the wind blew, small petals would flutter down upon their heads. Some would weave into Chia's unruly hair, and Toji would playfully pick them out. Chia, despite being in front of the children, would slap his hand away, her face flushing pink. Though it might not be as overwhelmingly beautiful as a snowy kingdom sprinkled with pink snow, it would still be quite lovely. Even if the cherry blossoms were not as splendid as imagined, what did it matter? Being together made everything alright. It was going to be alright. Zaro believed so. That sounds nice. Chia smiled warmly. The sight was truly beautiful. The next day, a call came to their home. I'll go to the supermarket nearby to buy some food. When Chia, dressed casually, said this, Zaro nodded without sensing anything amiss. It was their usual store, on a familiar path, one that Zoro had accompanied Chia on multiple times. Even at a leisurely pace, it was only a 20-minute walk, not as large as the supermarket where Zoro had encountered something before, but it was frequented often. Take care, come back safely, Toji said as he saw Chia off. Chia smiled at Toji and Zoro, then left the house. Two hours passed. It was about time for her to return. Just as Toji considered calling her, his cell phone rang. After placing Megumi in the crib, he immediately answered the call. The voice came through clearly enough for even Zoro, standing some distance away, to hear. This is the emergency room at Tokyo University Hospital. Are you the guardian of patient Tanaka Chia? What followed, how they ended up in the car, was something they could only contemplate after being crammed into the vehicle. Zoro, startled and crying, hugged Megumi tightly, looking at Toji seated in the front. Ignoring traffic signals, Toji sped towards the hospital, seemingly without a moment to spare for Zoro or Megumi. If Zoro hadn't quickly taken Megumi and jumped into the car, Toji might have left them behind to rush to the hospital alone. Zoro didn't blame Toji. He, too, was out of his mind. He replayed the information he had heard. A truck carrying large construction materials had collided with a bus, causing the securing devices to break. The materials rolled down a hill, striking the supermarket, injuring several people inside. Chia was among them. She was leaving the supermarket at the time of the accident and was severely injured, losing a lot of blood. She was immediately taken to the hospital, but her condition was so critical that entering surgery would likely mean certain death. And so, and so and so. Screech. The car came to a noisy halt in front of the hospital. Bang. Toji kicked open the car door and ran off. Zaro, clutching Megumi, gritted his teeth and followed as fast as he could. He had never run so quickly since being reborn. The startled onlookers murmured, but he had no time to care about that. Where, where is she? Where is Jia? After some searching, Zoro finally found where Toji and Jia were. Toji was holding Jia's hand as she lay in the hospital bed. 
Nearby, a doctor, possibly struck by Toji, was coughing and being supported by a nurse, a bruise forming on his face. Chia was in a terrible state. A respirator was attached to her face, and her spiky hair was matted with blood. Her body was covered with a thick white blanket, but so much blood had soaked through it appeared almost red. With his observation hockey, Zaro could sense the extent of the damage beneath. Having faced death numerous times and sustained countless injuries himself, Zaro knew. She couldn't survive this. Jia. Zaro approached the bed and called out in dismay. Even Megumi seemed to sense something, stopping his cries and looking around with teary eyes. Chia didn't open her eyes. Beep, beep. An unknown machine beside her emitted irregular sounds. Zaro's heart sank. Mother. At that call, Chia's eyelids fluttered. Struggling greatly, Chia opened her eyes. The whites were burst with blood, starkly red. Even in her battered state, Chia tried to smile. Attempting to grasp her hand, Zaro realized her hand beneath the blanket was completely crushed. Mother, Zaro called again. Chia managed a faint smile towards Zoro, then turned her head to Toji. With great effort, she spoke. Please take care of Zoro and Megumi. Toji gripped Chia's intact hand tightly. He said nothing. It was more accurate to say he couldn't. Zoro leaned close to Chia's face. Apart from when he was a very young child, he had never been this close to Chia. He needed to memorize every whisper of sound, every fractured smile. Nothing could be missed. Because there would be no more chances. That's why Zoro could hear it. I love you. Chia's last words. It was such a faint sound that he almost doubted he had heard it. But it was unmistakable. Heard by Zoro, by Toji, and perhaps even by Megumi. Her eyes closed. The slow rise and fall of her chest ceased, and Toji gripped Chia's hand as if it might shatter. A strange sensation brushed past Zoro's nape, and then beat the machine, emitted a prolonged noise. Zoro understood what it meant. He couldn't not understand. He had seen it with his own eyes. The doctor glanced at his wristwatch with a somber expression. March 27, 2003, 1.23 pm. Patient Tanaka Chia has passed away. Overwhelmed by sudden dizziness, Zaro, still holding Megumi, staggered and sat down on a chair next to the bed. His head was buzzing. Sounds seemed to reach him, but he couldn't make sense of them. Megumi burst into tears. Contrary to his usual calmness, it was the loudest cry since his birth. Zaro, almost subconsciously, held Megumi tighter and pushed away the hand of a nurse trying to help. He didn't want anyone near him. Not now. Memories of time spent with Xie flashed through his mind. The day he was born, the way she held him, her fluttering eyelashes, her prickly hair, and her sunshine-like smile. He felt nauseous. Chia's voice echoed in his head, causing disorientation. When the cherry blossoms bloom, shall the four of us go see them? Why had he assumed such a day would come naturally? Even knowing how death could strike in an instant, knowing nothing in this world is guaranteed. Why had he believed the four of them could be together as a matter of course? Zoro covered his eyes with the arm not holding Megumi. Whether his eyes were open or closed, it felt as if only darkness remained. It felt like the ground beneath him was crumbling away. There was no ground to stand on, Zoro didn't even try to recall, he was too exhausted for that. I'm tired. He didn't remember ever feeling this tired, even after long battles. Uh, you it. But the sound of whimpering immediately got him out of bed. Tiredness was one thing, but he couldn't just ignore that sound. Zoro walked over to the source of the noise, the crib. Megumi was fussing. The diaper check ruled that out, it seemed like hunger was the culprit. He opened the formula container and prepared a bottle with practice teas, a routine he had quickly become accustomed to over the past few days. Holding Megumi, Zaro placed the bottle in his mouth. The eager sucking suggested he was very hungry. Zaro felt a bit guilty. The house was silent. It was dark because the lights were off, but he couldn't understand why it felt so chillingly cold. It was April, it shouldn't be cold. Once the bottle was empty, Zaro, just as Jay used to do, leaned Megumi against his shoulder and gently patted his back. A soft burp followed, and Zoro laid Megumi back in the crib. Seeming sleepy, Megumi yawned with his little mouth slightly open. Zoro softly stroked his hair. Sleep well, Megumi. And, I'm sorry. Blink, blink. Green eyes hid behind the eyelids. Breathing became steady, and his belly gently rose and fell in sleep. Zoro looked around, then walked over to the bookshelf. There was a book so thick it could be used as a blunt weapon. Parenting encyclopedia it was the book Jia often referred to while raising Zoro. Whenever she had questions about parenting, she would consult this book. Of course, it didn't seem to have all the answers. Knowing nothing wasn't an option now. Zaro sat on the couch, placing the book on his lap and flipping it open. Despite the drowsiness that crept up on him as he read, he forced himself to continue. Zzz eventually, he couldn't fend off sleep any longer. Books had never been Zoro's thing. 
The combination of a dark living room, a thick book, and the lure of sleep was too much for him, and he inevitably began to nod off. Suddenly, it seemed like he heard laughter. You're a good brother, Zaro. Instantly awake, Zaro jerked his head up. But in the darkness that filled the house, there was no one else besides him and Megumi. What was I expecting? It was a voice that couldn't possibly be heard. A person who couldn't possibly be there. Yet, in the face of loss, people inevitably find themselves weakened. Closing the book and getting up from the couch, Zaro walked over to the window. The sky was pitch black, not a single star in sight. It wasn't the sky here, but once upon a time, Zaro too had made a promise under the night sky. It's a promise. To a friend who shared the same goal. Half unconsciously, Zaro's hand reached for his right side, the place where he used to carry his swords in his previous life. But now, without a sword, he only felt the emptiness at his side. Everyone eventually dies. Turns to bones. The strongest girl in the world, those called the strongest, emperors who ruled divisions of the sea, even the pirate king who turned the sea and the era on its head, all eventually died and became bones. Just as Jia died and was cremated, becoming a handful of ashes buried in the earth. Thunk, Zoro rested his green head against a windowpane. But it didn't end there. People leave something behind as they live their lives. Memories, will, dreams, stories, love a promise. Thus, death was an end, yet not the end. Even if one does not resurrect like Brooker Zoro, as long as there are those who remember and carry on their will. As the world and time continuously turn, and there exists someone who fulfills what that person wished for. If there is a continuation that even surpasses death. Zoro, too, had a promise with Xie. Tell them you love them. Moving away from the window, Zoro looks back at Megumi. In the peaceful face of the sleeping child, he momentarily sees Jie. It's heartwarming yet sorrowful. He hesitates, then speaks. After a brief pause, he delivers the intended message. I love you. It's awkward, but not dishonest. At least, that's what Zoro believes as he scratches his grass-like hair. It feels strange. But he'll get used to it. It was a promise, after all. Although Chie's request was solely verbal, Zoro knew that words alone weren't enough. Words were necessary, of course, but actions were equally important. After all, Zoro himself was a person who prioritized actions over words. He might not yet know exactly how to show love through actions. Naturally, the face of another person who expressed love very adeptly came to mind. Wrapping his thick arm around Chie's waist, lightly resting his head on her shoulder, and whispering, I love you. It was Toji. That day, Toji immediately took Chie's body from the hospital to the crematorium. After cremating Chie and burying her ashes in the cemetery, he sent Zoro and Megumi home in a taxi. And he didn't return. What's he doing? Zoro had no idea. There was no way to find out. He couldn't even call. He didn't know the number. Toji had never given Zoro his phone number, and Zoro had never needed to call him. After all, Toji had always been there. At times like this, Zoro didn't know how to accept Toji's absence. Let's just wait. He decided to wait and see, and if Toji didn't return, then he would take action. Maybe Toji just needed some time. Zoro settled himself somewhere between Megumi's crib and the front door. Leaning against a wall, he tried to catch some sleep in that position. It was still a chilly spring day. Xiu Kong had known Toji for a long time. From the days when Toji first left the Zenin family as a teenager, solving all sorts of requests and being called a sorcerer killer, Xiu Kong worked alongside Toji as his broker. That's not to say they were close enough to use a term as intimate as partners. The relationship was strictly that of a killer and the broker who conveyed assignments to the killer, nothing more. However, excluding those from his family, it was true that Xiu Kong was the human who had known Toji the longest. Toji was, how to say, a specimen of the dregs of life. A villain who killed people he didn't even know for money, a philanderer who changed women faster than clothes, miserly to men, but squandered all his collected money on gambling addiction in a flash, prone to creating conflicts with his mocking and occasionally lashing out, as if he was fed up with everything in this world. He might have been slightly kinder to women, but even that seemed motivated by his own needs. A host for a few days stay and a partner to satisfy his urges. To Toji, women meant just that much. He didn't even bother to hide it. Then, Toji met that woman. Xiu Kong didn't know her name. At first, he thought she was just one of the many women passing through Toji's life, so he wasn't interested, and later on, he deliberately avoided asking. Collecting information about a client's Achilles' heel could cost a broker his head. That woman was special to Toji. It was undeniable. After meeting her, Toji only accepted relatively clean and straightforward assignments. He stopped visiting the gambling dens he frequented, opting instead to date her, and his once skewed gaze and tone softened almost to the point of becoming a different person. Then one day, he suddenly announced his retirement. Xiu Kong had heard rumors of men who left the underworld for a woman, but never thought Toji would be among them. 
What kind of woman was she, to pique his interest? But Xiu Kong valued his life more than his curiosity. Knowing Toji's cruelty better than anyone, he had absolutely, absolutely no intention of digging up information about that woman. Losing a competent killer was regrettable, but Xiu Kong had other killers under his management, so it was something he could tolerate. Thus, they parted ways, and their contact ceased. Then, a few days ago, out of the blue, a call came. I need a sorcerer. It had been four years. The first words after four years were those. He needed a sorcerer skilled enough to precisely identify traces or remnants of magic, who would agree to a binding oath not to disclose any information. He would pay whatever it took, so bring them to the address provided as soon as possible. If it had been the usual voice, Xiu Kong would have been irritated. Calling after four years to say what and how. And where does one find a competent sorcerer willing to enter into a non-disclosure agreement immediately? It was absurd. If it had been the usual, that's what he would have said. But Toji that day was not his usual self. The content of his words was incoherent, breaking off abruptly, and his deep, submerged voice was shaking terribly. As if everything about him had shattered. After quickly contacting a retired first-class sorcerer, Xiu Kong went to the location Toji had mentioned. It was a hospital. There, shrouded in white and red cloth, was a form. Having seen many such sights during his time as a detective and a broker, Xiu Kong immediately knew it was someone's corpse. And that it was a woman. There are absolutely no traces of sorcery. The sorcerer, after meticulously examining the corpse, stated this. Though interested in money, the old man had never lied about his work. After all, he was bound by a pact to speak only the truth. Yet, Toji demanded a more thorough investigation. Thus, the market where the accident occurred and the truck involved in the accident were also inspected, but the result was the same. Not even the most common fourth grade spirits, not to mention a stronger curse, were found. It was not an intervention of sorcery, but merely an accident. Even to Xiu Kong, who was a non-sorcerer, it was crystal clear. The sorcerer repeated the same conclusion. There is no involvement of sorcery. It's just an accident. Upon hearing this, Toji commanded Xiu Kong to investigate the truck driver and the bus driver who caused the accident. He wanted to know if they had been paid to plan the accident. As expected, there was nothing. The bank records of both drivers were clean, and there was no apparent reason for them to have planned the accident. The woman's death was simply an accident, a combination of a slight mistake, misfortune, and coincidence. Xiu Kong removed the cigarette from his mouth and exhaled a cloud of smoke. That sharp man surely knew what Xiu Kong knew. He just wanted something or someone to blame. If the two drivers had been alive, he might have taken his anger out on them, but unfortunately, both had died on the spot due to the accident. Anyway, having been paid, Xiu Kong had to deliver on his money's worth. He gathered the investigation materials and got into his car. His destination was a boat racing gambling den where Toji used to frequent. Toji was sitting in his usual spot. Betting slips were scattered on the floor, indicating how many times he had already lost money. The ashtray was filled with cigarette butts, and empty liquor bottles filled one crate and spilled over to the seat next to it. Even though he rarely drank alcohol because he hated not getting drunk no matter how much he drank. Toji turned his head to look at Xiu Kong. His face was as expressionless as ever, but Xiu Kong could tell something had changed. The results of the investigation? Here? Xiu Kong handed over the thick stack of paper documents. Contrary to what he thought that Toji might just take the documents and tell him to leave, Toji continued speaking. I have something to say, so take a seat. I was about to leave, but then again, such is the life of a broker, always being called from one place to another. Xiu Kong sighed quietly and sat a few seats away from Toji. Whoosh. A boat sped past right in front of them. However, neither Xiu Kong nor Toji paid any attention to the scene. Thud. Toji, having finished reading, threw a bundle of documents onto the seat in front. Is this information reliable? I've combed through everything from the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department to insurance company data. That should be reliable enough. You know it as well. For those involved in contract killing, preliminary research is essential. Having received countless pieces of information, Toji had no choice but to recognize the truth in the data Xiu Kong provided. Toji said nothing. He neither cried, frowned, nor showed anger. He simply remained as he was. But sometimes, silence can be louder than any words. Naturally, Xiu Kong turned his head away. Getting emotionally involved with clients is a significant weakness for a broker. It was better not to create any unnecessary burdens for himself. Contact me if you want to work again. Anything else? Find someone to look after the kids. The kids? It was then that Xiu Kong remembered the children he had seen in passing that day. A boy with green hair, who seemed about 4 or 5 years old, was tightly holding a baby. Both had unusual names. What were they again? What are their names? The older one is Zoro, 3 years old. The younger one is Megumi. 
He was born last winter. I see. Xiu Kong responded casually. He hadn't realized the boy, who appeared to be four or five, was his son, since he looked nothing like him. Even the color of his hair was like grass. Get ready. Let me know the address later. I'll send someone. The nanny's salary will be deducted from your payment. Xiu Kong added, but Toji did not respond. Whoosh. A boat crossed the finish line, and Toji crumpled the paper in his hand. It seemed he had lost again, as always. But by now, Xiu Kong knew that it didn't matter what happened anymore. On the first day of April, when an unknown woman came to the house instead of Toji. Zaro knew that Toji would not be coming home. Toji is not coming back. Zaro mulled over this now unsurprising fact once more. Toji is not coming back. It wasn't a matter of days or weeks. October was nearing its end, which meant it had been over half a year since Chia had died and he hadn't returned home. Why? But there was no one to answer that question. In this life, Zaro's social circle had been extremely limited. The only people he had deeply interacted with were Chia, Toji, and Megumi. Megumi was too young, and Chia was dead. So, ironically, the only person who could answer was Toji, the very subject of his concern. As the sunset died the unfamiliar streets, Zaro frowned, feeling a throbbing pain in his feet. Upon removing his shoes, he saw his feet were swollen. Damn. Despite being physically superior to his peers, he was still not even four years old. Since Chia's death, he had sporadically engaged in strength training, but walking continuously from early morning until late afternoon had proven too much for his young body. It was time to head back. After another day out without any results, Zaro sighed. Couldn't find him today either. If only they could meet, then everything would be alright. Really? Would it really be alright? Unconsciously, he clenched his fist. His right hand automatically reached for his neck, touching the crude, large monkey-shaped ornament hanging from a necklace. Click. The monkey's head separated from its body, revealing a small blade hidden inside. Fiddling with the sword provided some cooling relief to his thoughts. This blade, found by chance in a storage room, was small but surprisingly sharp, and he carried it around. It reminded him humorously of Meg. Russell, Russell. At the end of a dark and filthy alley, he sensed a presence. It was neither human nor animal, but a damp and malevolent aura. Again? Zaro sighed inwardly as he walked determinedly into the alley. The stench assaulted his nose, making him scrunch it in disgust. He wondered for a moment if he should have ignored it, but he couldn't bear to leave something emanating such blatant malice unchecked, especially since Megumi took walks around here. Crunch, crunch. Something resembling a giant dog was trying to squeeze its way through a half-open window. Was it really a dog? Zoro couldn't tell since it was invisible to the eye. Hey. With a snap, it turned its head. A gurgling growl resonated, unmistakably threatening, but Zoro remained unfazed and continued. Could you keep it down? And not try to enter someone's house. Growl. It charged at Zoro with a loud cry. Clink, clank. The sound of its long, hard claws scraping the ground was heard. In the blink of an eye, it leaped at Zoro, aiming to pounce on him. Whoosh. The moment its elongated claws nearly grazed Zoro's neck, clang. Surprise filled the monster's numerous yellow eyes. A short sword, enshrouded in the black hue of armament hockey, blocked the giant claws seamlessly. I told you to be quiet. Why won't you listen? Zaro swung his sword indifferently. With a slicing sound, the creature's head was severed. Thud, thud, roll. The head, still clueless about the situation, remained frozen in shock as it rolled on the ground. He casually wiped the creature's blood on his forearm, relieved it hadn't splattered on the dark green bandana tied around his arm. Always something, everywhere. Though the numbers had decreased since summer. He flicked the sword to rid it of blood and sheathed it back. Long ago, when Zaro encountered something at the supermarket, he hadn't seen anything like it for a while. Not during walks, outings, or even shopping trips. But after Chia died and Toji left, forcing Zoro to search for Toji alone, he began seeing them far too often. It was almost as if they appeared wherever he went, exaggeratedly so. Until now, they've all been small fry. But that couldn't be all. There must be stronger ones out there. Maybe, just maybe, there could be one as formidable as those he faced in his previous life, only manageable by his former self. Have they increased since then? Or had someone been taking care of them before? His head throbbing, he ruffled his hair in frustration. Where are you, you fool? For the first few days after Chia's death, he tried to understand. Death is hard for anyone to accept, and the death of a spouse even more so. So, he waited, thinking that despite the sadness, pain, and torment, Toji would eventually return. But the person who came to the house was not Toji but a nanny. The young woman who said she would work in their home, initially worked diligently for the first few days. But once she realized there were no adults around, she began to slack off. 
When Zoro found her watching TV calmly while Megumi cried from hunger next to her, he chased the woman out of the house. She yelled something, but Zoro, covering Megumi's ears, paid her no mind. A few days later, another person came to Nanny but fled after seeing Zoro picking up rocks in front of the house for strength training, calling him a weird kid. The third nanny was a man who, having heard something from the previous nannies, treated Zoro like a ticking time bomb. He tried to force him to the hospital or prevent him from being near Megumi. When Zoro got angry, he quit just the same. Many nannies came and went after that. The current nanny is pretty good, though. The current nanny took good care of Megumi, but was completely indifferent to Zoro. Whether he lifted and lowered rocks for training, swung a long wooden stick around in his room, went out in the morning and returned late in the afternoon, or wore a necklace with a large ornament, she didn't care. She didn't even speak to him. He was treated as if he were invisible. He didn't mind that. As long as she was good to Megumi, that was enough. He didn't think he needed much care now that he wasn't a newborn anymore and could move his limbs somewhat freely. The issue was that during this entire time, Toji had neither come home nor contacted them once. He must know. Since Zoro had never given money to the nanny, it was clear that Toji was the one paying her. Even knowing that the nannies couldn't last more than a few weeks and a new one had to be brought in repeatedly, he never once came home. Whenever a nanny left, it was Zoro who had to take care of Megumi until a new nanny arrived. Although a new nanny was usually found within a few days, during those days, Zoro was stuck looking after Megumi without a break. Megumi was a good baby, but a baby nonetheless. A being with more things they can do than can. If Zoro took his eyes off him for even a moment, Megumi would inevitably get into some kind of mischief, preventing Zoro from training whenever they were without an Annie. When Chia was alive, Toji never entrusted any part of child rearing to Zoro. The same went for chores like cleaning or laundry. Even when Chia was pregnant with Megumi, Toji took care of Chia himself and didn't ask Zoro to do anything. At most, he told him not to press on Chia's belly, but that was a natural request for the health of both Chia and Megumi. But now, aside from hiring an Annie, he had left almost everything else to Zoro. Is it trust? Or does he simply not care what happens? Before Chia died, Zoro would have naturally thought it was the former. But now? Honestly, he wasn't sure. If Toji intends to return. Why he hasn't returned. Why he knows but still neglects. If they still mean anything to Toji at all. Click. Zoro slid the sword back into the wooden ornament. Pondering alone was pointless. I need to ask him directly. But there was no way to meet. He didn't know where he was now, nor did he have a phone number. Zoro didn't own a cell phone, and Toji had always been by his side. Whenever Zoro needed Toji, he just had to call out to him, but not anymore. The only link was the nanny walking with his thoughts, he suddenly found himself in front of his house. When had he arrived here? With a puzzled tilt of his head, Zoro entered the house. Right as he walked in, he bumped into the nanny, who was just about to leave. Upon making eye contact with Zoro, the nanny reflexively frowned slightly. Not particularly bothered, Zoro glanced past the nanny at the clock behind her. 6 p.m. Right on time for her to leave. Normally, he wouldn't bother speaking to her, but today, he had a question. About your employer. No reply came, but knowing she was listening, Zoro continued. Can you give me his phone number? Or maybe the location of where he's staying now? The nanny passed by Zoro without a word and left the house. A clear snub. He hadn't expected much, so he wasn't particularly disappointed. Pressuring her might have worked, but with only Zoro and her to look after Megumi, alienating the nanny was not an option. Brother. Hey. Were you okay, Megumi? Ooh. Megumi made a sound that could either be considered a response or babbling, as he tried to crawl towards Zoro. Zoro stepped back and said firmly. Not now. Having roamed outside all day, and especially after having blood splattered on him from that dog, he couldn't hug Megumi. There was a chance of transmitting germs that could make Megumi sick. It was one of the few useful pieces of advice he had gotten from the third nanny. Megumi grimaced and pouted his lips. Where had he learned that? From the wrinkles between his brows to his facial features, he was a spitting image of Toji. Strangely, there was a warm feeling deep in his throat. I'll take a quick shower. Zoro headed straight to the bathroom. After showering, Zoro immediately picked up Megumi. The sweet smell of milk wafted from the little body snug in his arms. He quickly scanned Megumi. His belly was plump, and his clothes were clean. The skin under his clothes was free from any bruises or wounds. It seemed he had been well taken care of today. Zoro felt a slight relief. He knew this nanny was good for Megumi, but it was still important to check. Next to the baby's sitting area, a thin picture book caught his eye. The nanny had bought a few picture books to read to Megumi. Zoro read the title written on the book's glittering cover. Mommy, Daddy, Yum Yum a fitting book title to read to an 11-month-old child. 
Megumi pointed at the daddy figure on the book's cover, then pointed his finger at Zoro. Daddy? No. I'm your brother, not your daddy. Try saying it, brother. 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 Right? Kayak. What was that sound? Ooh, um, eeing. Really? Zoro let out a short sigh. When would he grow up? Nearly a year old now, but Megumi was still very much a baby. Brother. Why? Daddy. I told you, I'm not daddy, where? Zoro stopped mid-sentence. People raising babies could somewhat understand what the babies were trying to say. Not everything, but to some extent. So, Zoro understood what Megumi was asking. Daddy, where? Where is daddy? I don't know. I'm not sure. Ever since Jia died, I haven't been able to understand what Toji is thinking. But soon, I'll bring him back. Hmm? Really? If that person is still our father, that is. Swallowing the rest of his words, Zoro stroked Megumi's head. His already spiky hair seemed to stand on end even more, resembling a sea urchin. I love you. As always when he returned home, Zoro calmly made his promised statement. Megumi's green eyes widened before he smiled broadly. His round, white face was adorable. Lo, V, you. Yes. After a long conversation, if it could be called that, Megumi finally fell asleep. Zoro quietly drew the curtains and turned off the lights, watching Megumi sleep peacefully. He went to the small room used as a storeroom and fetched a rock. It was a rock he had picked up when he started strength training after Chie's death. I'd like to buy weights if I could. But no one would sell weights to a three-year-old. So, he had no choice but to use rocks. I need to become stronger. Even if catching up to his previous life's level in one go was too ambitious, he at least needed to surpass the physical capabilities he had at this age in his past life. To walk faster, walk longer, so he could continue moving forward without getting tired, even if it was the same path over and over. So he could find Toji. And once he found him I'll have to decide. Whether that person is still our father, or not. Toji opened his eyes. Instinctively, his senses sharpened as he scanned his surroundings. Beside him, a half-naked woman was curled up, softly asleep. In the gentle darkness, the patternless ceiling and the calm-colored wallpaper came into view. The light leaking through the curtains was crimson, indicating it was almost evening. He noticed an aquarium in the corner. Inside was a single fluffy, round marimo. Seeing the marimo brought to mind the face of a child that resembled it. And the woman holding that child. Frowning, Toji got up from the bed. The woman beside him woke up to his movements. You're awake, Ryasuke? Toji gave a polite smile to the woman who casually used the false name he had given her last night. Sleep more. MMM will you come again? Toji left an ambiguous we'll see. And left the house. He could feel the woman's longing gaze, but unfortunately, Toji had no intention of coming back. The place was decent enough, and the predictability of the woman had initially tempted him to consider seeing her again, but that inclination had now vanished. If asked why, well. He didn't want to stay in places that brought back memories. He walked the streets. In the early morning, the bustling crowd didn't notice him at all. Using his nearly invisible presence like the drifting wind, Toji made his way through. His destination was, as always, the race betting place. Greeted by faces he saw almost daily, the betting office clerk mechanically took his money and handed him a betting slip. Toji didn't bother to look closely at the odds or even what race it was, he randomly marked the slip with the pen at the counter. He was thirsty. Holding the betting slip, Toji went into the shop next to the counter as he always did. It was early, and the preparations were incomplete, a part-time worker was seen moving crates of beer bottles. Maybe it's time for a drink. After paying, Toji looked down at the large crate of beer bottles in his hand. He wondered why he suddenly felt like drinking. After all, it's not like he'd get drunk. What day is it today? Around November 8th? Toji tilted his head as he glanced at the betting slip in his hand. As usual, today's date was printed on it. November 11th. Ah. It was that child's birthday. Happy birthday, Zaro. Almost crumpling the betting slip in his hand absentmindedly, Toji headed to his usual spot as always. As he slumped down, the plastic chair screeched as if in protest. The race was about to start. Ready, set, go. He followed the movement of the boat starting off with his eyes, but his mind was not focused. Win or lose, it didn't matter. Although he always approached betting with that mindset, today was different. November 11th. Birthday. Is he now four years old? He thought simultaneously that it was too soon and yet so late. The thought of ordering a gift crossed his mind, then he felt foolish. When have I ever bothered so much about the kid? The nanny would take care of it. Even if she didn't, well. What does it matter? Bang. Toji effortlessly popped the cap off a beer bottle and gulped down the large bottle in one go. He knew drinking wouldn't intoxicate him, yet there were moments he couldn't endure without it. 
After emptying the large bottle in no time, he carelessly set it down and opened another to drink. Then another, and yet another. The green-haired child in his memories turns to look at him. The child's usually stern face softens slightly, smiling faintly as he calls out. Dad. Behind the child, a warm figure approaches. Spiky hair flutters, and a sunshine-like smile illuminates the scene. Ah, that's why. He tries not to think about it. Crash. The beer bottle shattered into pieces in Toji's hand. A few glanced his way at the noise, but seeing people lose big and cause a scene was common in betting places, so interest quickly waned. Anyone at the race betting place at this time had likely had their share of similar outbursts. They wouldn't have imagined someone could smash a beer bottle with their hand. Betting, whatever. The thought of bolting crossed his mind, but there was nothing for him outside either. With this mood, he'd only dwell on similar thoughts outdoors. Crunch. Glass shards fell from Toji's hand. It reminded him of the time he had stared at his own hand after smashing a phone. Toji lifted his arm to cover his eyes. He didn't want to think, didn't want to remember. Because memories of that child always led back to her. That child was always with her, and she was always with that child. Toji, too. The memories he had been suppressing overflowed, leaving him reeling. It was absurd to think someone like him could feel dizzy from a few drinks. In the past, yes, there were times he took care of that child. Because he'd get into trouble the moment I looked away. He had to stay close. The child would reach for knives or bottles, try to walk in haste and fall, or get lost and wander in circles in secluded places. Apart from when he was a newborn and cried for attention, the child rarely expressed himself, requiring even closer observation. He wouldn't say if he got hurt or felt unwell. He had to ensure the child wouldn't get injured in the first place. So, Toji would preemptively eliminate any threats in the areas the child might visit when going out. Of course, living in Tokyo, it was possible for a minor demon or a fourth-class spirit to appear in that short time Toji lowered his arm. With an emotionless face, he picked up another beer bottle and took a big gulp. The child was high maintenance. Not that he minded. Stroking the child's inexplicably green hair, the child would look up with a puzzled expression. What are you doing? Trimming the grass. Whose head is grass? Even as he pretended to be angry, he couldn't genuinely hit him. A real hit from the child's soft fists wouldn't hurt Toji, a seasoned fighter. His soft nature was amusing yet worrying. He planned to stay by his side. As Toji saw it, the child was his, so he wouldn't exploit the child's gentle nature, but others might not refrain. Many would pounce like spirits, knowing of his softness. Just need to protect him until he can stand on his own without getting hurt. He was a strong and fast-growing child, so maybe 10 years? If it took longer, maybe 12 years? By then, he should be able to distinguish those trying to use him. If not, well, I can step in. As a father, he could do at least that much. And tease him a bit while at it. He truly thought so. Until the day it all became meaningless. Toji opened another bottle and took another drink. He didn't feel even the slightest hint of intoxication. By now, it didn't matter anymore. Nothing was important. Not money, women, others, not even himself. And probably, not even his children. Take care of Zoro and Megumi for me. How could you say that to me? Knowing what kind of person I've been. Not unsure of what I might become. If you were worried about Megumi, it would have been better to tell that child directly. That child is particularly good at keeping promises. Even without such a promise, that child would have taken care of Megumi anyway. Soon, a crate was emptied. Passersby glanced at Toji with weary faces. Toji's expression was grim as he looked at the randomly inserted empty bottles in the crate. With the two of them, Megumi would be fine. Stubborn, occasionally a bit foolish, and with a strong-willed streak, but that child would always cherish Megumi. He had left money with Xiu Kong too. About 100 million yen. Despite being a true money grubber, Xiu Kong wasn't foolish enough not to know that swallowing that money would mean losing his head. Megumi, unlike that child, is a sorcerer it should be fine. That child won't mind. It's not like that's the only family like that. When Megumi grows up, Megumi will cherish that child too. That child, despite pretending otherwise, is kind, so if raised by that child, Megumi will likely be kind too. Then, they'll be alright. Really? A voice echoed from deep within. Will everything really be okay? Toji gritted his teeth. Shut up. He had provided a home to return to, a nanny to take care of them, and enough money for the foreseeable future. What more was he supposed to do? He himself had grown up without any of that and still became an adult. Why wouldn't they be okay with all those advantages? As Toji struggled with these thoughts, the voice whispered softly. That's not what the child would have wanted. The last face he saw on the day he buried her remains flashed in his mind. The look of incomprehension as Toji pushed him into the taxi. The small face, distorted with sorrow and bewilderment, yet clearly questioning. Why aren't you coming with us? 
Toji let out a short, dry laugh. What the child wanted was gone now. The man who cherished that child died with Xie that day. What remained was a powerless monkey and a sorcerer killer who had taken countless lives without remorse. Staying by their side would only taint them with his sins. Especially for that child who wasn't even a sorcerer. Toji had seen enough of how ordinary people entangled in the unfortunate fate of the sorcery world met their downfall. Lies. A mocking voice sounded. You know better. Ordinary? That child? That child isn't ordinary. The voice was assertive. You know. You've always known. Ever. Since that child was in her womb. Toji clenched his fist tightly. His nails dug into his flesh, drawing blood. On November 11th, exactly four years ago from today, when he heard that the child had been safely born. The first thing that came to Zen and Toji's mind was a single question. How? When she was pregnant, although she didn't show it, Toji despaired every day. Because he felt nothing but the heartbeat. No movement, no sound, no emotion. Apart from the heartbeat, there was no sign of life. The belly grew, the due date approached, but the child was silent. Unable to tell her the truth as she worried about not feeling any fetal movement. The child seemed dead. No, it was questionable if the child had ever been alive. Unable to lash out at the doctor who cautiously mentioned the possibility of stillbirth, Toji faced that day feeling like livestock being led to slaughter. Yet, against all expectations, the child was born healthy. Confusion and astonishment came before joy. How could this be? Until yesterday, there was no sign of life apart from the heartbeat. And when he saw the child in her arms, Toji was struck with an astonishing realization. Different. That child was different. He couldn't pinpoint exactly how, but he knew. The inevitable tension when witnessing something unknown. Curiosity. Questions. Confusion. All these feelings mixed together as Toji hesitantly held the child. So small, so warm. The moment the child opened his eyes, looking up at him with the same gray eyes as his mother. Toji felt all those tumultuous emotions wash away like waves on a sandy beach. Tears dropped on the child's cheek as he realized like a bolt of lightning. Ah, I wished. I wished for you to live and breathe in this world. Really. Contrary to the absence of any movement before birth, the child after birth was very healthy and active. The child loved Toji and her, and so Toji gradually began to forget the shock and tension he felt at the moment of the child's birth. Or rather, he pushed it to the back of his memory. He might never have recalled it. That day, at the supermarket. Had. He not seen those grey eyes of the child looking back at him. Toji vividly remembered that day. It was when the three of them had gone shopping at the supermarket. Despite having cleaned up the spirits the night before, a girl affected by a fourth-class spirit appeared near Zoro, likely due to the crowd. Tokyo, with its abundance of spirits, was always a problem. He considered ignoring it, but ultimately, Toji sighed and pulled out a daggership talisman from his pocket. It was a simple item, barely qualifying as a third-class talisman, but more than enough to deal with passing spirits or those of the fourth class. The spirit was annoyingly attached to the girl's head, but he planned to swiftly slice it away, as soon as the two of them turned their backs. That was the plan. Until he saw the spirit being cleaved in two, headed straight for the child. Toji froze. Had he killed it? Did his son, kill the spirit? It wasn't with sorcery. Having spent his life envying, chasing, and killing those with sorcery, he knew. That wasn't sorcery. Nor was it any spell. And then the child turned around, looking straight at Toji. The moment he met those calm gray eyes, identical to the first time he saw them, Toji felt as if he had been electrocuted. It wasn't a casual glance. At that moment, the child was clearly aware of Toji standing behind him. Toji reflexively noted the child's eyes were ordinary. Calm, achromatic, shining without any hint of magical mystery within those clear eyes. That gaze was all the more shocking. Once again, a voice resonated in Toji's head. A non-sorcerer kills a spirit and holds a weapon, yet notices your presence quietly standing behind? Is that possible? The voice sneered. You know who was the only person before that child to notice you standing behind? He knew. He was aware. It was impossible not to know. The first time he was ever detected from behind was one of the most shocking moments of his life. The possessor of the six eyes and limitless. The one destined to reach the zenith of the sorcery world. Satoru Goho. And yet, that child was much younger than Goho had been at the time. Not even of age to manifest Jujutsu. Toji's mind unfolded a panorama of events from raising the child. The peculiarly rapid physical growth. The way he seemed to understand everything said to him from a very young age. The incident where a curse split in half and died upon encountering the child. He had thought the child was a non-sorcerer. Clearly possessing some degree of cursed energy, unlike Toji with his zero cursed energy, yet not enough to be a sorcerer. Moreover, the child couldn't even see curses. But if that wasn't the case. 
Either a different kind of non-sorcerer, capable of producing jujutsu output with a minimal amount of cursed energy, comparable to a sorcerer, or or something else entirely, an existence previously unknown. Either way, it was better for him not to be by the child's side. He appears to be a non-sorcerer on the surface. Even Toji, having raised him for several years, is only now beginning to guess. Even among sorcerers, there would be no suspicion about the child's existence. Unless he's that brat from the Goho family. Being around Toji would inevitably entangle the child with the sorcery world. He didn't want that. The world some desperately wished to enter, while others struggled to escape. To Toji, those oblivious to their own blessings were fools. When he's older, he'll be able to choose for himself. Whether to live in the world of non-sorcerers or sorcerers. Unlike him, who from birth belonged to neither world. So, whoever is by the child's side, it would be better than Toji. Pretending to care. The voice murmured with a mix of scorn and pity. In the end, it's just fear. He's a stubborn child. There's no way he would let Toji go easily if he returned. He would cling, insist on staying. Despite everything, he is the child's father. He would grab him, sit him down, over and over again, for fear of letting him live in a world without her. Boom. The first boat crossed the finish line. Then the second, followed by the third. The announcer's voice boomed excitedly. First place, number four, second place, number six, third place, number five. An upset, a major upset, this can't be, it's rigged. Screams filled the air as betting slips fluttered into the void. Toji slowly looked down at his own betting slip. First place was number four, second place number six, third place number five. He had won. For the first time in a long while, no, perhaps for the first time in his life, Toji felt bewildered by his windfall. Stepping out of the betting parlor with his winnings, Toji paused. What should he do with the money? He didn't want to go back to that woman's place, and with enough money on hand, there was no need to woo a new one. He wasn't even hungry after all the drinking. Should he go back? The thought suddenly crossed Toji's mind, prompting him to smack his head. Am I drunk? On just a crate of beer? But being sober made even less sense. Go back? Why, exactly? Just. Because it's his birthday thud. Toji banged his head against a wall. He must be drunk. There had been times he drank three times as much and remained unaffected, but for some reason, now was different. Guess I'll go into an expensive restaurant, eat and drink whatever I want, and then sleep. Sleeping it off and then taking on a job from Xu Kong should clear his head of these random thoughts. Just as Toji was about to head towards a street known for its upscale restaurants, he halted. He narrowed his eyes. A barrier? At the end of the alley, a barrier had been erected. Is there a curse? Even for someone with zero cursed energy, it was impossible to sense what was happening behind a closed barrier. Unless he broke through it. Whoosh. The barrier vanished. Looks like it was dispelled. Either that or the sorcerer who cast it died. After all, barriers, being extensions of a sorcerer's energy, dissipate once the sorcerer's energy vanishes. Getting involved could be troublesome, whether it was a curse or a sorcerer that emerged. Right in front of him, of all places. Annoyingly, Toji clicked his tongue but turned to leave quickly. Tap. He stopped dead in his tracks. A spell? No, it was instinct. He knew the owner of these footsteps. Tap, tap, tap. Someone was walking from where the barrier had been. Toji turned to see who it was. Green eyes widened. You? The person had grown since the last time he saw him, wearing tattered clothes barely different from rags. He wore a peculiar necklace, and in his hands, he held weapons that looked like bones of a beast. Drip, drip. Green hair drenched in red blood, with droplets falling to the ground. It was a sight Toji had never seen or imagined, but undoubtedly it was Zoro. At Toji's call, Zoro slowly lifted his head. His gray eyes sparkled as they met Toji's, just like that time long ago at the supermarket. The deathly silence followed. Unable to find words, it was Zoro who spoke first. Found you. Toji. That day, unfortunately for Zoro, whose birthday it was, started off with bad luck right from the morning. Aya Megumi, who was usually calm, began screaming near the window after seeing something that startled him in the morning. It didn't seem like he was just scared of a bug or a bird, so Zoro looked around with his observational skills, but whatever had scared Megumi had already disappeared. All that was left was a sobbing Megumi, and Zoro had no choice but to pick him up and comfort him. After Megumi's crying finally stopped, it was time for the nanny to arrive. However, she did not come. Not after 30 minutes, not after an hour. It was only at 10.30 a.m., an hour and a half past her usual arrival time, that the nanny showed up and said, the car in front had an accident, so the road was blocked. Was it the truth, or just an excuse? Zaro looked at the nanny quietly before responding, I see, and turned away. After all, there was no way to know which it was at the moment. After making sure the nanny fed Megumi his lunch, Zaro left the house. 
He left later than usual, so he didn't have much time. That's why he hurried. Could that have been the reason? Where is this place? When he came to his senses, he found himself in a place he had never seen before. There were no familiar shops or houses in sight, only an old house on the verge of collapse. Zaro, without taking his eyes off the house, clenched his necklace and then turned around. A young man in his mid-twenties with a kind face was walking towards him. Oh. The young man tilted his head, looking at Zoro, then smiled gently. Are you alone? Who are you? Ah, so you can speak? I'm Kimura Taisei. This is my house. The young man introducing himself as Taisei opened the door and went inside. Contrary to its dilapidated exterior, the interior of the house, visible through the open door, was filled with blooming flowers, and looked meticulously tidy, exuding peace and comfort. Taisei extended his hand from inside the house to Zoro standing outside. It seems you've lost your way. Would you like to come in? Then I can call the police for you. Taisei spoke kindly. Zaro looked at the hand offered by the young man, and then chuckled. No, I'll pass. I've already seen the inside of a fish's belly plenty of times. The smile vanished from Taisei's face. The kind expression hardened into something ominous. With an impassive face, he spoke. That's unfortunate. You could have died peacefully. Snap. With a flick of Taisei's fingers, the house distorted. The lovely view of the house lost its color, turning monochrome before melting away like a watercolor painting exposed to water. Writhe, writhe. The roof turned into shimmering scales, and fins sprouted from its sides. The sweet-smelling door became the gaping maw of a giant fish. Its body elongated and thickened, filling the narrow alley. Three red eyes stared down at Zoro. When Taisei pointed at Zoro, the creature surged towards him as if swimming through the ground. With a swift leap, Zoro easily jumped back, evading the gaping maw of the fish. Taisei frowned. Quick for a little guy. I wondered how you got here without being affected by the curse, turns out you're a sorcerer. Sorcerer? Zoro tilted his head at the unfamiliar term. Noticing this, Taisei laughed. What, you don't know? Well, it makes sense of your age. Especially if your parents are non-sorcerers. I was the same. He chuckled. Anyway, you're an incredibly unlucky child. I have no intention of letting you go. No hard feelings, but it would be troublesome if the higher-ups noticed. The giant fish monster loomed behind the smug Taisei. A very clear hostility and intent to kill emanated from the two in front of Zoro. Without a word, Zoro drew a dagger from his necklace. He felt strangely exhilarated. It was a mix of happiness, excitement, and relief. The one thing that was clear was Zoro's focus. Because it's my first fight? Since being reborn, Zoro hadn't encountered an opponent worth seriously fighting. Either they were too weak to constitute a real fight with Zoro, or they had no will to fight him at all. The former were the nameless weaklings he had cut down countless times, and the latter was Toji. Unlike them, the guy named Taisei and this fish monster in front of him, possessed both the power and the will to threaten Zoro. Let's see who's really unlucky in the end. The dagger, fitting snugly in Zoro's small palm, turned pitch black with an aura of determination. For now, there was no need to overthink anything. Let's go wild. A feral smile spread across his lips, like a predator about to pounce. Kimura Taisei let out a laugh, a mix of disbelief and genuine amusement. Wants to go wild? The kid? It wasn't meant to belittle, the figure before him was literally just a child. Barely reaching his waist, with small hands, arms, legs, and an almost comically green head of hair, everything about him was diminutive. Five years old? At most six? Since sorcerers typically manifest their techniques between the ages of four and six, there was a chance, if fortunate, this child had already manifested his. But manifesting a technique isn't the end of it. The little one in front of him wouldn't know, but even if one is born with a technique, without constant experience and innate talent, it's hard to make use of it. The born technique itself might not even be useful for combat. Taisei's technique was such a case. Well, it all depends on how it's used. Taisei glanced above. The barrier is already in place. The boundary here served as both a barrier and a veil. Meaning, even if he killed the child here, it wouldn't be visible from the outside. However, while the details within the barrier remained unseen, the presence of the barrier itself could be detected by other sorcerers. Suddenly, Taisei looked at Zoro. His calm yet firm gaze reminded him of someone. Was planning to make it quick and leave. His mind changed. Guess I'll feed him to the spirit's hole. Thinking innocently, Taisei spoke up. My technique is disguise. Caught off guard by the opponent's sudden explanation, Zoro narrowed his eyes. Taisei, unfazed, continued. Exactly as it sounds, with a snap of my fingers, I can make something appear as I wish it to be seen. The house you saw earlier also has a different reality. It only appears that way, the actual form of the object doesn't change. With the activation of his technique, a binding effect is triggered. The next moment, the spirit moved. Swoosh. 
Zaro narrowly dodged the charging fish spirit. Bang. It seemed as if something massive slammed into the wall, creating a dent. A crunching sound followed, along with the thumping of what seemed like a giant fish flailing, sending dust flying. Zaro squinted his eyes. There was almost nothing to see, but the actuality was definitely there. Plus, that guy's ability to disguise or whatever it was. So did you disguise a huge thing as something very small? Correct. I made it appear as a pebble the size of my fingernail. I'd make it smaller if I could, but that's my limit. Of course, it's not the only thing I can disguise. Snap. Taisei snapped his fingers and disappeared from Zoro's sight. Zoro swiftly swung his dagger. Snap. Clang. As soon as the snapping sound was heard, the form of a monster with a twisted neck and protruding tongue appeared in front of Zoro. A fist dripping with yellow itcher was blocked by Zoro's dagger. It licked its lips with its tongue, slickly. Aren't you surprised? It was Taisei's voice. Taisei laughed with his five bleeding eyes. It was a chilling sight, but Zoro didn't even blink. He had seen too many incredible things to be startled by this. Clang. 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 The clash between fists and dagger occurred several times. Time and again, punches aimed at vital spots were blocked by the dagger, wrapped in a black aura of armed color. Whoosh. A fist charged with cursed energy narrowly missed Zoro's cheek. If he hadn't defended with the armed color at that moment, blood would have been drawn. Damn, I knew it. Whether it was the fish spirit or Taisei, Zoro could clearly sense their movements with his observation hockey, unaffected by the disguise. What use was seeing them as small pebbles to the eye? The flow of their actual form and cursed energy was clear as day with his observation hockey. Unfortunately for Taisei, who had even initiated his technique to enhance its effect, the disguise technique itself had little effect on Zoro. But I'm still not at an advantage. The lack of physical prowess was the issue. Even with the ability to predict movements through observation hockey, his body couldn't keep up, making evasion difficult. Although his proficiency in armed color remained the same, his attack speed was too slow to make an impact. Swoosh! As Zoro swung his dagger, Taisei jumped back to create distance. Zoro frowned. He felt the cut, but it was shallow. Without the ability to use ranged attacks, he had no way to strike an opponent at a distance. If only I had a proper sword. He would have snatched and used it if Taisei had wielded a sword, but even that wasn't the case. Well, what could be done? I have no choice but to close the distance. Zaro gritted his teeth. Crack. The fish spirit that had been smashed into the wall pulled itself out. Dust flew up, and a few bricks were dislodged. GRRRR. Angered, the spirit thrashed about, slamming its fins against the ground. Whoosh! Zaro leaped high into the air, dodging the fish spirit's massive body slam. From mid-air, Zaro, using his observation hockey, sensed the shape of the toothless gaping mouth and the fairly straight body of the spirit. An idea sparked in his eyes. Maybe? Let's try this. As the spirit opened its vast mouth to catch Zoro falling from the air, Zaro didn't evade, but instead fell right into it. Gulp! The spirit swallowed Zoro whole. Seeing Zoro's form bulging from inside the spirit's body, Taisei laughed. It's over. The kid was nimble, dodging this way and that, but in the end, it was futile. Just as Taisei was about to turn away, a strange noise caught his attention. Crunch. The spirit writhed as if uncomfortable. Again, crunch, crunch, and then, sing. With a flash of blue sword energy, the spirit's body split as if cut by something sharp. Screech, screech. The spirit screamed in agony before its movement ceased altogether. Pop. Bursting out with blood, Zaro sliced through the spirit's belly and lightly landed atop the corpse. Taisei's eyes widened in shock. Cut his way out from the inside? Is he serious? Could that tiny body and a dagger the size of a finger really have that much power? No, even more, how could he withstand the poison within the spirit's innards? A mere child of five or six years old? Zaro, having observed Taisei in a daze for a moment, lightly shook off his damp hair. Drops of the spirit's blood fell. He felt the solid bones through the collapsed body of the spirit. Zoro grinned. Thought there might be something, and there was. Lucky me. His murmurs sounded almost gleeful. This could be useful. Crack. Zoro forcefully stepped on the spine of the spirit. Inserting his hand into the red flesh cut open by the sword, he picked up two pieces of the sharply fractured spine. They resembled swords. Click. With the dagger clenched in his mouth, Zoro held a long bone shard in each hand. The armored color wrapped around his hands spread over the entire bone, staining the once white bones black. Taisei's expression hardened. It should have looked ridiculous, but there was nothing funny about it. Instead, he felt a chill run down his spine. Trying to appear unfazed, Taisei asked, what's that? Some kind of circus act? No, it's Santoryu, three sword style. Consider it an honor. You're the first to see this in my current life. Clash. Zaro's arms, holding the bones, crossed. 
His gray eyes sparked with a red ferocity. Like flames rising, a fighting spirit and aura envelop his entire body. Taisei hastily strengthened his body with cursed energy. Instinct sent a warning. He couldn't block this. He needed to flee. But it was already too late. Santoryu. Zaro leaped towards Taisei. Realizing too late that he was outmatched, Taisei threw a punch enveloped in his full cursed energy. The moment the fist charged with cursed energy, met the bone swords filled with Zoro's spirit, SSSSSHHHHHH. The bone swords easily tore through the cursed energy and flesh, slicing across Taisei's body. Onijiri. Aya, thump, thud. As Taisei fell, Zoro removed the dagger from his mouth. Then, he turned to survey Taisei. Is he dead? He's dead. That strange mass seemed to still be breathing, but it was clear it had no strength left to fight. Without feeling the need for a confirmatory kill, Zaro, who had no qualms about taking lives, dismissed it and tucked the dagger back into his necklace. The sky writhed, and the barrier that had enveloped the sky popped and disappeared. Of course, Zaro didn't know what the barrier was. Anyway, it's about time to head back home. Where is this place, anyway? Aside from the two he had just dispatched, there was nothing familiar in sight. Did that guy disguise the surrounding paths? No, he was dead now. Zaro scratched his head. That's when it happened. Click. Zaro gripped the bone sword tightly. A powerful presence. Far stronger than the two he had just killed, there was a formidable presence nearby. Holding the bone sword and tensing his body, Zaro walked out of the alleyway where the barrier had been lifted. Step, step. Zaro furrowed his brow. The approaching presence felt strangely familiar. And then, they met. You? Ah. It was Toji. Toji looked surprised. Seeing his son covered in blood after being apart for over half a year, it was probably a natural reaction from his perspective. Zoro slowly rolled his eyes up and down, assessing Toji. At least he wasn't hurt and seemed healthy. Even as he felt relieved at that fact, an unbearable anger surged within him. He lifted his head to meet his eyes. Shaky green eyes looked back at him. Silence ensued. With so much he wanted to say, Zoro couldn't decide where to start. Finally, at last. Found you. Toji. Have you returned? Did you come looking for me? Where have you been all this time, and what have you been doing? Why didn't you come back until now? Do you know how much I've looked for you? Zaro was full of questions he wanted to ask, filling up his throat. For now, he swallowed all those questions. There was something else he needed to do first. Click. Adjusting the blade of the bone sword in his hand, Zaro strode towards Toji. The bone sword turned black, wrapped in a strong aura of armed color. Toji, coming to his senses too late, hurriedly approached Zoro. What happened to you thump? Before he could finish his sentence, the flat side of the bone sword, charged with as much armed color as possible, struck Toji's lower abdomen directly. Ugh. Feeling as if his stomach was being sliced in half and a nauseating pain overwhelmed him, Toji clutched his belly and doubled over, retching. He was dumbfounded, both by the fact that Zoro had attacked him, and that the attack was very painful. Thud. The impact caused the armory spirit that had been swallowed to pop out of his mouth. Luckily, it wasn't dead. Toji had thought it might have died from the shock inside his body. Seeing the coiled up armory spirit, Zaro raised his foot, seemingly about to stomp on it. Toji hastily stopped him. No. Spirits that can store weapons almost without limit are very rare. Moreover, killing it now would mean the artifacts inside couldn't be retrieved. Zaro paused to look at Toji, then slowly opened his mouth. Is that all you have to say? It seems we're meeting after quite a long time. Toji. Not father but Toji. Before he could even process his feelings about this, Toji's hand instinctively reached out to grab Zoro's arm. However, fearing he might hurt Zoro if there were any injuries, his hand didn't actually touch his skin. The moment his hand caught the tattered clothes, Toji's instinct screamed. Hospital. Toji hoisted Zoro up and slung him over his back. Zoro stiffened in surprise. What wait a minute. First, we need to get you to a hospital. Why Zaro was here, why he was covered in blood, why he attacked him, and why that attack was so painfully effective were questions for later. After getting to the hospital, after making sure Zoro was alright. Then it wouldn't be too late to talk. Toji quickly picked up the armory spirit, swallowed it again, and prepared to run. Zaro, realizing what Toji was doing, wriggled on his back. Wait, there's still something I need to say. I'm going to run. Make sure you hold on tight. I'm not hurt. Can you hear me? To avoid human eyes. No, that's not the issue. The quickest route what about Megumi, is Megumi also like you, would you listen to me? Bang. While Toji was rambling, Zaro hit him on the head again with the flat side of the bone sword. The pain made Toji groan and clutch his head. In the meantime, Zaro had jumped down from his back, and now stood in front of Toji with his arms spread wide, declaring firmly. I'm not hurt. 
And neither is Megumi. Look, no injuries. Only then could Toji properly assess the situation. Indeed, Zaro's clothes were torn and dirty, but there wasn't a single small cut to be seen on the skin underneath. And from behind Zaro, there was the smell of blood. Reflexively, Toji moved to Zoro's back, positioning himself as if to protect him. Though he felt no presence of the living, that was the case. Two bodies were lying in the dark alley. One human, one spirit. The human seemed to have just died, judging by the scent of blood, and the spirit was nearly dead. Suddenly, Toji recalled the disappearing barrier. Barriers disappear under three main conditions. They're destroyed from the outside, the sorcerer who cast them lifts them voluntarily or the sorcerer who cast them dies. It can't be. A four-year-old child defeated both a sorcerer and a spirit? Without a single scratch? Having grown up in one of the three great families of Zenin, living a life as a sorcerer killer and encountering numerous sorcerers, he had never heard or seen anything like this. I beat them. Zaro said calmly. His face looked too much like usual. Barely moving his lips, Toji managed to ask. How did it happen? Zaro let out a deflated sound. It seemed like he was both astonished and trying to suppress his anger. Is that really what's important right now? A few days ago, during the early hours when he neither slept nor trained, Zaro had decided, upon meeting Toji again, to recognize him. To see if Toji was still their father. Or if he wasn't. If they still meant something to Toji, it would be the former, if not, the latter. The chances were 50-50. Zaro had resolved to stay neutral until he met Toji. Otherwise, if the outcome differed from his expectations, his response might be delayed. So when Toji suddenly picked him up, Zaro was truly flabbergasted. It was incomprehensible how someone usually so perceptive couldn't even notice the absence of injuries and, pale with fear, insisted on going to the hospital while inquiring about Megumi's well-being. And yet. Why didn't you come back? Knowing that we might not be okay. Knowing that we still mean something to you. Knowing that you still love us. Don't beat around the bush. Zoro's voice, biting and harsh, pierced through Toji's ears. Speak your true mind. Toji was frozen, unable to avert his gaze from those blazing gray eyes. True mind? What was he supposed to say? That he wished it all became meaningless? That he wished not to recall any of it? That he didn't want to meet you, who reminds me of her and keeps me tethered to this world? In a world without her, I didn't want to live. He couldn't utter those words in front of Zoro, even if his mouth were torn open. So, Toji picked the words closest to his true feelings from the many thoughts swirling in his head, and spat them out. It's better for you without me around. Being born from him alone was enough to inherit the curse of the Zenin family's malice. A monkey with not a trace of cursed energy. A cursed executioner who had accumulated nothing but karma. Toji swallowed the rest of his words. It's better not to have me around. Better to vanish as if I never existed at all. You're holding on because you don't know. What kind of being I am, what I've done. Anyone would be better for you than me. Anyone. Hearing this, Zoro's face crumpled in disgust. Why do you get to decide that? Why Toji was deciding who would be better than him for them, Zoro couldn't fathom. It was Zoro's and Megumi's decision to make, not Toji's. And you're seriously mistaken about something. What I need isn't a father. It's you. Zoro pointed at Toji with a finger. Whether someone else is better than you, whatever you are. I don't care about that. His captain was a man with nothing in his head, but rubber. He had been comrades with a money-crazed miser, a long-nosed guy, a damp perverted cook, a reindeer that looked like a raccoon, a creepy woman who was once an enemy, a robot, a skeleton that came back from the dead, and a merman who was once one of the seven warlords of the sea. By now, having a peculiar father was nothing surprising to Zoro. He wasn't even interested in knowing. I am a villain. Much worse than you think. I already know that. If he had been a good person, he wouldn't have abandoned his promise to Chia and neglected his children. But for Zoro, who had a bounty of several billion berries and was a former great pirate, judging who was good or evil was meaningless. What mattered was whether that person was on his side. I'm not a good son either, so I'll do as I please. If Toji was their father, Zoro had no intention of letting him go easily. Of course, he should stay. You don't like it? I'll do as I please. You don't hate us anyway. A bad son? So be it. After all, you're not a good father either, so it's similar. It was a very Zoro-like way of thinking, comparable even to his captain in terms of not listening to others. Toji quietly looked down at Zoro. His words wouldn't take. It was like throwing a ball against a wall, bouncing back no matter what he said. Usually, in such situations, Toji resorted to force, but this was not an opponent he could use force against. At that point, Toji Zenin's defeat was sealed. Zoro asked as if granting a favor, so, do you have anything else to say? I do, but you'll just ignore it anyway, Toji thought, the words nearly escaping his lips. He imagined a casual ah, as a response if he did speak up. 
He couldn't win, nor could he flee. If he tried to run, this tiny creature seemed like it would chase him to the ends of hell. He might not ever be called a good father, but he couldn't bear to let his child venture into hell. Noticing Toji's resignation, Zaro's eyes sparkled with triumph. Yes, I've won. Stubborn as a mule, just like his son. That reminds me. There was still one thing he wanted to say. Happy birthday, Zaro. Zaro paused, then tilted his head, before his mouth fell open in realization. Right, it's November 11th. He had honestly forgotten. Birthdays were never a big deal to him. The fact that Toji remembered his birthday, something he himself had forgotten, surprised Zoro, but also made him feel like hitting Toji again. It sure took you long enough. Sorry. Idiot. I thought I'd never have to see an idiot like you again after that day. Zoro muttered. A small hand reached out towards Toji. Zoro looked up at him with a calm expression and said, let's go, home. Megumi is waiting. Toji quietly looked down at Zoro and then placed his hand over Zoro's. And precisely at the moment when he couldn't hold back a sigh anymore, seeing Zoro leading them down a dead-end alley. The way home isn't that way. Hey. And wait a moment. We can't leave it like this, it'll cause trouble and get rid of that bone too. Why oh? Normally, when a curse dies, it disappears without leaving a single drop of blood. The bone from the curse in Zoro's hand crumbled into dust like ash. Naturally, unlike the curse, the cursed user's body remained intact. After all, it was human. Even though it was a secluded alley, the discovery of a cursed user's body, slashed to death in broad daylight in Tokyo, would send both non-sorcerers and sorcerers into a panic. It was impossible to clean up completely, but erasing the traces was necessary. Holding Zoro's hand, Toji took out his phone with the other, and pressed the numbers firmly. First, he planned to call Xu Kong to erase the traces. Then, they'd stop by the hospital. Even if there were no visible injuries, it was better to be sure. After that, they would go home together. And what comes next Toji closed his eyes tightly, then reopened them. Somehow everything felt distant, unreal, and overwhelming. How things turned out this way, what would happen next, it was all uncertain. Yet, strangely enough. It felt like he could finally see a path forward. Tadaki I'm tired. Zaro, who had just left the hospital, rubbed his eyes. It was already getting dark outside. Considering it was November and the sunsets early, it meant it was quite late. I wanted to go straight home. Toji had insisted on taking Zoro to the hospital, which thwarted his plan. Despite repeatedly asserting he wasn't injured, Toji insisted on getting the examinations, leaving no choice but to comply. Although some test results were still pending, the outcomes thus far were perfectly normal. Well, the doctors did find it odd that for someone who just turned four, his height and physique were quite large. Toji glanced sideways at Zoro. Are you okay? Ah, uh, it's nothing. Gurgle. Just then, Zaro's stomach growled, making his face turn bright red. Toji chuckled a bit. Zaro often got embarrassed over trivial things. It seemed not much had changed since before they parted ways. Do you want to grab something to eat on the way home? Zaro immediately shook his head in response to Toji's question. I need to go home. It was almost time for the nanny to leave. If he didn't head home now, Megumi would be left alone. That's absolutely not happening. Are we walking? Or should we take a taxi? Zaro asked. Toji suddenly remembered how Zoro had almost lost his way several times while walking to the hospital earlier. Taking a taxi would be best. I'll hail a taxi. Stay here. After looking at Toji's face for a moment, Zoro spoke up. No, let's go together. Alright then. Zoro immediately reached out and grabbed Toji's hand. Unlike the usual behavior of children not wanting to be away from their parents, Zoro, even though he held the hand, positioned himself a good distance away. Precisely, he was behind Toji. Toji couldn't help but smirk at the overt gesture. Zaro was now blocking any retreat. The implication was clear. You don't trust me. Me. Considering it, it really would have been foolish to immediately trust a father who hadn't shown up for over six months after the mother's death. I'm not yet worthy of being treated as a father. Toji was painfully aware of his misdeeds, too aware to feel slighted by Zoro's hesitation. Ignoring Zoro's attempt to intertwine fingers, Toji hailed a taxi. Once seated next to Zoro in the back seat, he suddenly asked. How's Megumi? Zaro's head turned slowly towards Toji, his look sharp, as if criticizing Toji for asking only now. He's doing well. He even started speaking a bit. Though, for the most part, it was just calling Zoro Dada. Apologize to Megumi properly. Alright. Toji knew well that an apology might not make much sense to a baby not yet a year old, but since Zoro insisted, he agreed to do it. And tell him you love him. Do you say that to Megumi? I do. Because I promised. To their mother. Swallowed by rising memories, Toji remained silent. Zaro said nothing further. 
The taxi driver, sensing the atmosphere, also kept quiet, leaving the car in silence. When the taxi stopped in front of the house, Zaro quickly exited, his eagerness apparent as if he couldn't wait to get inside. Toji lingered for a moment, gazing at the small house. He had finally come back. Let's go. Zaro grabbed Toji's arm, pulling him along with a surprisingly strong grip. Toji didn't resist, allowing himself to be led inside. As they opened the door, Megumi, seated in his crib, smiled broadly at Zoro. However, when Toji followed inside, Megumi squinted at him, tilting his head in a mix of curiosity and uncertainty. Inside, the nanny was preparing to leave for the day. Upon seeing Toji follow Zoro in, she frowned. Who's this? Their father. Eh? Hey. Hello? Her voice rose at the end, clearly surprised. Understandably, she hadn't expected someone who had never shown up during her employment to suddenly appear. Seeing someone new, Zoro glanced at the nanny and asked. Did anything happen with Megumi today? No, nothing. This was the first time the nanny responded directly to Zoro's question. Toji noticed a subtle awkwardness and reluctance in her voice, causing his eyebrows to twitch. After getting the answer, Zoro went to wash his hands. Seemingly uncomfortable under Toji's silent gaze, the nanny mumbled something about it being time for her to leave and quickly exited. Zoro, returning from washing his hands, noticed Toji's stern expression and asked. What's wrong? That nanny. Does she not like you? She ignores me, mostly. Why? I wouldn't know. Zoro then hurried towards Megumi's crib. Dada. Have you been good, Megumi? Megumi waved his arms towards Toji. Zoro pointed at Toji with his finger. Megumi, that man is your papa. Ba, pa. Not papa, papa. Dada. Right, I brought him here. Come here, Toji, Zoro called. Toji walked slowly to stand in front of Megumi, who had grown noticeably since the last time he saw him. Although still small and tender, Megumi now had a distinct human shape. Green eyes met green eyes. Megumi reached out his hand towards Toji's face. The little hand first touched the chin, then moved up to the cheek, mouth, and nose, exploring as if someone blindfolded was feeling their way. Toji slightly lowered his head, allowing the small hand to touch his forehead. Pa. Megumi uttered softly. His hand gently caressed around Toji's forehead and then suddenly, he grabbed a handful of Toji's hair and pulled hard. Ouch. Both brother have such strength. Toji grumbled. Papa. Dada. Ow. Megumi, stop. If you grip too hard, your nails will dig in and hurt your hand. It's my hair that's being pulled out, my little sea urchin. Toji gently unfurled Megumi's tight grip on his hair. Seemingly in a bad mood, Megumi puffed up his cheeks and huffed. With his spiky hair and round face, he looked exactly like a sea urchin. My children are like marimos and sea urchins. Toji once again seriously contemplated how things had come to this. As Zoro stroked Megumi's hair, the child calmed down and gave a beaming smile. The stark difference in his demeanor when interacting with each of them left Toji feeling bemused. Yet is this a good thing? After all, during his absence, his children weren't alone. The sight of spiky hair unavoidably brought to mind someone else. Before spring arrived, leaning against a bed with Megumi, looking at Zoro's face and smiling that clear smile. Please take care of Zoro and Megumi. Toji hadn't kept his promise. It was Zoro who had looked after Megumi, and Zoro who had taken care of himself. It was what Toji should have been doing. He envisioned that person in front of him, their beloved grey eyes moist with emotion. The lips sealed tight in a mixture of resentment and sadness. I ask you to. Toji smiled bitterly. He spoke to his children in front of him and to his wife, who had already departed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He opened his mouth to speak, then closed it again. Toji felt he had no right to say those words. Not to his child, not to that person. Papa's name is Toji. Now, try saying it. Toji. Tu Jai. Good job. I love you, Megumi. Dada. Toji silently watched from a distance as his little ones comforted each other. His heart ached. Toji opened his eyes. Despite having fallen asleep on the sofa instead of his bed, his head felt surprisingly clear. It was the first deep sleep he had enjoyed in a long while. He felt a weight and warmth on his legs. Glancing down, he saw Zoro sprawled out across his legs, deeply asleep and snoring softly. Beside Zoro, in a baby crib, Megumi was quietly breathing in his sleep, making tiny, gentle sounds. It was an unusually peaceful scene. Toji watched quietly, trying not to make any noise. The phone rang. Zoro's eyes flickered open, and he quickly surveyed his surroundings. Meeting Toji's gaze, Zoro's green hair received a gentle pat. Go back to sleep. I'll take the call and come back. Toji got up from the sofa and walked away. He opened the balcony door, stepped inside, and closed it behind him. Although the sound was muffled, the balcony door was made of glass, allowing Zoro to see Toji from inside the house. Checking the phone, it was Yukon calling.
Why? Why? Why well, after killing a person and a curse in broad daylight, in the middle of Tokyo, and leaving the clean up to me, you ask why? Toji wasn't the one who had killed, but there was no need to correct that. Listening to Xiu Kong's irritated voice, Toji rubbed his ear with a finger. It was just a curse anyway. Yeah, just a curse. And we were tracking it through Tokyo's jujutsu circles. Circles, Toji's lips curled into a smirk. Then let them find it. I'll handle it anyway. I've already done that. Didn't have time to clean everything up anyway. Just roughly messed up any traces that could indicate who killed it. It's a miracle it hasn't caught the sorcerer's eyes yet. When curses die, they don't leave a corpse but disappear, whereas the bodies of cursed users are clearly visible even to non-sorcerers. Getting caught would have been troublesome. By the way, what tool did you use? There was nothing but the residual traces of the cursed user and the curse. While not as overt as a sorcerer's main power or spells, tools do leave some residual power or traces. The absence of such traces was curious. Toji shrugged nonchalantly. Who knows? Well, you have no reason to tell me, do you? This one took a lot of effort, so I'll need to charge a lot. As if he was trying to swindle money. Toji's lips twisted into an amused smirk. I have something to say to you about that. Hmm. The nanny you recommended has been neglecting her duties. Before falling asleep yesterday, Toji had asked Zoro about the possibility of changing nannies. He saw no reason to employ someone who blatantly disregarded Zoro. But the response he received was astonishing. She's the best we've had so far. What? She's not the first nanny. She's either the seventh or eighth. The nannies have been changed. The first one was driven away by me, but all the others left on their own. This was news to Toji. He was unaware both of Zoro driving away the first nanny and the frequent changes thereafter. It made sense, though, since Xiu Kong had been handling the finances for the nanny out of Toji's fees, and he also found the nannies. Xiu Kong gave Toji the contact information for the first nanny, but he hadn't provided contacts for any that followed. If a woman who avoided even making eye contact with the child was the best nanny they had, it was evident how unsuitable the previous ones had been. Toji clenched his teeth. If you're taking the money, you better be responsible for the value. Wait, Toji. That, uh, how it happened was forget it. Be prepared for the next time we meet. Ah, uh, there's one thing I want to ask. The grade of the cursed user and the curse we killed, what were they? Xiu Kong sounded puzzled in his response. Shouldn't you know better, having dealt with them directly? If Toji had directly confronted them, that would be true. However, by the time Toji saw them, they were already defeated, making it impossible for him to gauge their strength. Forget it, just tell me their grades. The cursed user who died was at least grade 3. He was judged to be grade 3 before escaping from the Tokyo Jujutsu High. It's been over 10 years since then, so it's possible his abilities could have improved. Was he originally associated with the High? Yes. He was a student at Tokyo Jujutsu High, but in his third year, he killed a fellow student sorcerer and stole the curse that the student was subjugating, then fled. The curse you killed was that one. And the grade of that curse? Grade 4. But this curse could uniquely absorb a part of the cursed energy of whatever cursed power it consumed, so by the time you killed it, it wasn't grade 4. Given that the cursed user had been active for over 10 years, it could have been grade 3 or even grade 2. Toji? End call. Wait, then next time I see you click. Toji hung up the phone and was lost in thought. The cursed user was at least grade 3, and the curse was at least grade 4, likely around grade 3. So, what grade would Zoro be, having faced both and emerged unscathed? He didn't just defeat them, he was without a single injury. Could a grade 3 sorcerer defeat another grade 3 sorcerer without any injuries? Especially when being jointly attacked by a grade 3 curse? How the fight went down was unknown. The cursed user could have made a mistake during the battle, or the curse might have turned on its summoner, due to losing control. Clearly, Zaro had fought them alone and won, without sustaining any injuries. Does that mean he's at least on the level of a grade 3 sorcerer? Maybe even a semi-grade 2 or grade 2 sorcerer. It would be difficult for a grade 3 sorcerer to fight another grade 3 and emerge completely unscathed. In Zaro's case, there was more to consider than just his grade. A grade 3 sorcerer? That's possible. Even among non-sorcerers, there are those who can reach that level of jujutsu power. Plus, Zaro carries the blood of the Zenin family. Being a grade 3 sorcerer would be common in that lineage. The issue was his age. Yesterday was his fourth birthday. The age at which a sorcerer child typically manifests their technique is between 4 to 6 years old. Even if Zoro miraculously manifested his technique on his fourth birthday, utilizing it to defeat an enemy, especially a grade 3 cursed user, was an entirely different matter. It was also unclear whether Zoro was a sorcerer in the first place. Toji recalled the moment Zoro's hand and the blade turned black as he slashed across the cursed spirit's abdomen with a bone. 
He brushed back his hair that had fallen over his forehead. There was only one person who could answer all these questions. Toji opened the balcony door and stepped back into the living room. Receiving a calm and unreadable look from Zoro, Toji cautiously began. I have something I want to ask. Zoro shrugged, a signal to proceed. Your power. The way your hand and the blade turned black hockey. What? It's called hockey, that ability. Zoro jumped off the sofa. I thought you might know, given who you are. Murmuring to himself, it seemed Zoro was considering whether this power was unknown here. He then quickly added, let's go out when the nanny arrives. I'll show you what hockey is and what it can do. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.